across through your career here um, and believe it, I wrote a lot of stuff here that I that I found rather interesting because um, um, I had met I, I talked to uh, two two people that you know uh, Jesse I've talked to him last year as a matter of fact I got an interview later on today uh, to to do a sit down with, with him Jesse yeah Jesse V Johnson yeah you're a good buddy and I also talked to uh, Ashlyn Yenny as well too who you worked with on Antidote I've, I've actually spoken with her not too long ago as well um huh. uh, on the show as well too so right so there's quite a few people that i've come across that you have uh worked with um in in recent years so i became a really big fan of you when i saw the debt collector about two years ago and when i saw i saw i, I mainly saw because of scott because i'm a big scott atkins i was like i'm a huge huge fa fan of scott cool. but then when i saw the film debt collector your performance is really what won me over. And you had such a familiar face to me that I, I know I've seen you from somewhere. And then of course, after I saw that movie, I did a, a bit of research on your background. Of course, I've come across that you've been in a lot of stuff that I have recognized. And for whatever reason at the time, um, I'm not sure why you slipped under the radar for me. So once I saw that film, uh, I decided to look into your career and started to uh, check out a lot of the movies you've done in, uh, in the past up until this point. Um, so I've come across a lot of the movies that I have found to love in the last few years that I've also become a fan of other people's work because of your film. That you did. Right. Uh, one of which is, is actually William Coffey, who in fact, I actually will be scheduling an interview in July uh, because, because, I, because I saw the film, The Brave. So right, right. when I saw that film, because I think it, I think in Europe, I'm not sure, I think it's called Lazarus uh, Laz Burning. Lazarus Burning yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I saw that movie, loved what Will had done in that film. And then I looked into his film, I was like, wait a minute, I've actually seen some of his other movies too. So like, it became like a trickle effect. So ever since I saw Jesse V. Johnson's films, it led to one thing. So it basically became like six degrees of Kevin Bacon in some way or form for me to find a <laughs> different set of people that I've come across that I've uh, became fans of as, as a result of that. So your performance in Debt Collector has won me over and made me become a fan of you as, as an actor from that point on. Um, so... When I when I looked into your work, I had come to find out that you've been, been in the industry for quite some time. In fact, your first film, which I don't know if you can tell behind me, but that's actually a weird wall of VHS is behind me. One of those I films is actually <laughs> one of those films behind me is uh, Necessary Rougher, which I didn't realize I had had right when um, when and I had seen it. I haven't seen it in such a long time, but I knew I had it somewhere and it was actually actually stacked over here in this section. But at any rate, um, so again, it's one of the things that I have realized I have seen you before. It's because you have such a familiar face from The Quest and many other films. Um, you know who I am, Rob? I'll tell you who I am, man. Yeah. I'm the kid that everyone went to college with. I walk down the street and uh, nine out of 10 times, people are like, hey, man, where do I know you from? I'm like, right. uh, and they're like, where'd you go to college? And I'm like, no, nah, that ain't it, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm the guy. I'm the face that people can't put the right. name to, you know? But that's yeah. fine. That's beautiful. But, but, you know, your work in, mm -hmm. uh, in Debt Collector, I, for me, I, I always felt like that really kind of changed a lot of things for you in your career because um, I, I tend to think that as a result of that work, of, of, that, of your work in that film, um, more more people tend to took notice of your work and in fact you actually been you, you i know you mentioned in a recent interview that because of your work and friends um mm -hmm. that's really where your name became more a part of that that pop culture stratosphere now because of your involvement with the show so it almost seems as if though like the tides have kind of turned a little bit for you if, if from what i can uh, pick up on uh because of you know what you've done in the past now slowly starting to catch up to you um, here but then you've also done some other things on your own as well too which i often happen to catch as well uh films like the curse which i thought was a fun uh, little horror movie that i really did enjoy um and then of course a film that you directed called blackout which i actually wanted to ask you about because i um i wanted to point out that for anyone that doesn't know that you are also a writer director in your own right i know you didn't write that movie um but i know you were offered the script uh, and then you had mentioned something that, that brought my attention, which I was really curious if you can in, in, indulge me here with, because uh, if I remember correctly, you were offered a script uh, from one of the producers that thought you would be a good fit to direct, to direct the film. And then you read the script. They didn't feel like as if though what they, what the people's reaction was going to be was more, was not authentic enough until you showed it to an officer and the officer says, oh, it's legit. And therefore you decided to keep some things and make some little minor changes along the way. That was blackout. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So when, when I saw the movie, 
loved it. But I was curious as far as like what it was about that film that felt like the, the where the producers felt like you were a perfect candidate for that for, for you to direct it because I know you've you've directed a few other things, but I want to know what it was that caught their attention that felt like you were the right part, right person to direct a film. Right, uh, Blackout was a, a great journey, man. I yeah. um, for, you, for for everyone who hasn't seen it, I highly recommend it. The poster does no justice because I mean yes. I've got my sales company, and one thing that drives me absolutely crazy, everyone with yeah. this business is you bleed out your eyes for a year and you make a really cool film, and then these can I swear on your thing or not really? Yeah, these I'll just call them imbeciles. Yeah, these imbeciles who package these movies, they. Look, I call them imbeciles, but they're really not. They're, they're pretty savvy business people. But what happens is the artistic integrity goes out the window because they're concerned about sales and sales only. So they do what they believe is going to help people pick up the movie. And quite often what they believe is putting the worst, absolute worst, um non-resemblance dysfunctional poster attached to a movie so as a filmmaker you're like you just destroyed everything because in my opinion the poster of that blackout movie was the worst i've ever seen in my life and it really pissed me off but that is the hype the movie's fantastic if you haven't right. seen it highly recommend it um i met with jordan mardar and elise pugilese jordan mardar was the writer producer and he was the boss um, it was semi-autobiographical about him and his father. It was a really deep, incredible story. And I was in LA and they were looking for a director. They met four or five people. I think I was the last guy. And Jordan hired me on the spot. It was great. Right after lunch, he said, you're the guy. Um, I'm a very unconventional. I'm, I'm, I'm out of the box as far as the director. You know, I, I, I do what I believe needs to be done to, to try and reflect life and, and recreate the the Re reality of recreating life for the first time. So when the audience sees it, they believe it. And when I told them how I work, uh, to be honest, uh, the lady Elise wasn't really, she just didn't get it. You know, it's like all these production meetings. I'm like, I don't need to be there. You're wasting my time, you know, let me storyboard, let me make the film. Jordan appreciated that. And that's how I got hired. It was one lunch. And he appreciated the same thing that everyone else said. Um, in regards to the script, uh, funny enough, Will Kaufman's another Jesse Johnson. He's been so good to me and he's mm -hmm. a dear friend. And these two cats have, have changed my life, to be honest, because they've showed faith in hiring me. So I was actually doing, I think I was doing a Will Kaufman movie. And uh, I read the script and prior to meeting the guys for the meeting I just mentioned, it was a, the black, if you haven't seen it, it's about a catastrophe, it's a blackout and people start eating each other and killing each other to survive. I mean, the basic uh, reaction that humans have under catastrophe, instead of coming together, we pull apart and we are still, I guess, innately animals deep, deep down and we instinctively want to survive beyond all uh, reason. And uh, when I read the script, it was the second day in the storyline where people started to kill and shoot each other. And I called the producers and said, come on, I'm not, I'm just, I'm just not buying this. I don't think as human beings we would turn on each other that quickly. Well, there was a whole SWAT team behind me uh, on the Kaufman movie. And there was a detective who's been there and done that. I mean, a high ranking dude. So I hung up and they heard me. They said, what's going on? And I said, I want, they want me to direct this script. I said, but I'm not buying this part of it. And the guy said, dude, he says, two days, how about two hours? And I said to him, you're joking. He told me three or four real stories where there was, you know, a hurricane, a storm, an earthquake, whatever it was. And he said, two, three hours later, the looting begins, the robbing begins. And I just, he told me these stories and I went, wow, that is legitimately kind of part of our uh, DNA. We, we right. do this. So yeah, yeah. that was the discussion. And then I went back and I called him. I said, look, I'm in, I love it. Then <laughs> I took the script yeah, and I went to town with the ultra violence because I said, yeah. man, it's true. So that was a, a little behind the story of the uh, situation with not, not believing that that would happen and innately it does and more so. Right. Well, so when you got the confirmation from that officer or that in that SWAT team, that kind of just changed the, the, your, your perspective on how to approach the film as yeah. a result of that? Correct. Okay. Well, Correct. so when I saw that movie, um, that to me was actually a turning point for me to look at you uh, as far as your career is concerned because uh, – that movie I thought was very, it's a good film. And I do agree with you about the poster because I think the poster doesn't do any justice. Uh, Cause I remember, it's horrible, I, isn't it? 
Yeah, I didn't like it. I'll be completely frank with you. Um, but you know, there's a lot of posters that I've come across that um, where the it doesn't do the film justice. But then when you watch the movie, it's like it's like night and day. Correct. So this was one of those Correct. movies that was like that because I'll be completely honest. When I first saw the post, I was like, "Geez, I don't know how the film's going to turn out." If that's, that's what I'm talking about, man. Yeah. We lost a lot of people like you because of the poster, and they did that on another movie called Hotel of the Dam. That we I saw did. that movie too. <laughs> Good movie, right? For a it was a, movie, it was actually great. completely different from what I because yeah I mean and, and, and same be, thing with the poster yeah I I because I, I started excuse me when I started to look into your work um that's kind of the most consistent thing that I came across with some of the films that I've seen that you've been in which the posters don't do the film justice yeah. um and then but when I watched the movie I'm pleasantly surprised and realized how good of a project the film actually really is um, but again one of those uh, like for me when I saw Blackout. Uh, not only was it was that I enjoyed the film, but I, I had realized that, okay, you are a very good director and this is not me kissing ass. I really do believe that you are a good director. Uh, and I was hoping that, you know, that film would eventually gain some traction and eventually we would see more of your directing. Uh, but I think around that time you were already, you're on the verge of making your next film that you were also writing, directing and starring in as well too, if I remember hearing correctly. So I was look, I'm still looking forward to seeing that what that project is going to be because I think it might have been either Smokers or General I can't remember which film it was okay. you were working Smokers on. probably Smokers okay yeah. uh, because I think Ashton was at one point during our conversation she said that you know while you were in LA shooting Antidote um you were in post production with one of your other projects as well too but we, she wasn't sure which one it was I was assuming it was a uh, Smokers but again I'm not really entirely sure uh which one she was referring to but um, but again, it's one of those projects that you were actually working on. So right. uh, when I when I heard when I was talking to her about that, it, it dawned on me too. I was like, oh, that's probably why he's so busy because he's you know constantly you know tr tr making uh, one thing after the other, but then at the same time weaving in other projects that he's worked on on another project because you were using their editor as well too out in LA. Correct. While you work, yeah. So she was telling me. Wow, well. news travels. <laughs> well, I mean, it was just because we yes. were, we were t we were talking about you during the interview uh, with her because. Uh, I was uh, telling her, truthfully, the reason why I only saw Antidote was because you were in the movie. Um, and I rented it the day it came out on Amazon and I enjoyed the film. I did tell her, I told her too at the time that when I first saw the movie um, that I didn't click with it right away. So thankfully I saw it again the second, the third time. Okay. And then it registered with me and I was like, okay, now I get it. But, but at the same time, I, when I look back on it, I was a little tired when I saw it. So I was kind of like half-assing it when I was watching it. So I knew that I had to watch it again to get myself really acquainted with the movie and I'm glad I did because it actually was a very good film and her performance was good your performance was uh, really, really fantastic I, I knew you were going to be good Thanks, every time man. I saw the movies you watch in um there's no doubt in my mind you're going to deliver 100 percent that so I had no doubt thank about you that. sir so but that movie turned out to be very well and we talked about her experiences in the film as well too and she actually had a lot of great things to say about you uh <laughs> providing some insight. thank you Ashlyn about what you had advised her that helped her you know to take with her career and making some choices with regards of what the kind of work she'll be working into is next but when i saw your film blackout um then i came across other movies that you were also hands-on as well one of which was the curse and that's a movie that uh you had also produced as well out in tennessee if i'm not mistaken Correct. right yep. right Yep. And at the time it was called, it was something else entirely different. It didn't have the title of the curse. It was something else, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Tenebris or some, some, something. Something yeah. like that. I can't remember, but I remember it was something yeah. to that effect. But um, that movie, when I saw that, um, I liked it. I'll be completely honest. I liked it. Um, I'll, I felt like it was a, it was a, it was a film that the poster did not do it well uh, justice by really presenting what the film really was about. Um, but I loved the fact that you, you and your brother, because that was actually the first time that I had seen a film that both you and your brother had worked in together. Uh, and then, of course, you guys had worked before on more than one occasion, of course, Blackout, uh, yeah. Sinners and Saints. Um, so when you guys had, so when you were working on that film, I know that this was a, a, a pretty much almost like a passion project for you as well, too, if I'm not mistaken, that you were kind of involved in once it started picking up some momentum for you to finally actually make it uh, into production. Um, that movie, I didn't really get too much info on, but so I was hoping that you can provide some insight from me because, uh, I did enjoy the film a you lot. Did? Actually, You're talking about the curse. You enjoyed yeah, it. Of course. Yeah. I did enjoy that film. I actually saw it three times. So interesting. I, Very no, interesting. Dead that serious. It was on uh, Amazon. I don't know if it's still available now, but I think actually, no, I think that back. Yeah. It was on Amazon. And then it was available. It's also available on Tubi as well too. So I happened to catch it on Amazon. And then when I was out somewhere, I, I happened to catch it on Tubi again, just to get myself, 
uh, reacquainted with some of your work again in preparation for this uh, interview. So having watched that film, not a lot of info I could find on the movie. And I was hoping that you can share sure. some insights. As far as the curse goes, it was uh, myself and Brad Thornton, my dear friend, mm -hmm. Brad Thornton, we produced this film and we were young producers. It was kind of yeah. the first big film we were helming. And, um, you know, it's never easy making a film, man. It's uh, actually filmmaking is nothing but dealing with drama, to be honest. Yeah. And then you've got a little bit of the creative side for a couple hours a day, but the rest is dealing with people and dealing with dramas. And that film was one of the biggest uh, drama, people-filled film I've ever made. I mean, it was rough. We learned so much. The film looks beautiful. I think the acting's pretty damn good. I think, like you said, you summed it up good. It's a good film. It's just that sometimes you only have a script to work with, if yeah. you know what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. So you got to shoot what's written on the page. And at some right. point you can get whoever, you can get De Niro to, you know, whatever. And they're going to do what's written on the script. It, it doesn't change much, you know? So yeah. that was the problem with that. To me, the script kind of, it, it just, it didn't go anywhere huge for me. You know, these days with films, audiences have been around. Do you want to give them yeah. a little flair and give them something different? And I don't think it had that at the end, but as far as a, a film, it's worth watching, it's fun, it's a good journey. Um, and it's that type of villainous character, which I don't want to give away, but right, you know right. you know what it is. It's the, yeah. the mystical ghost guy who comes back and starts killing everyone. Um, my brother and I, actually, before I forget, if you haven't seen a film in the eyes of the killer or blindsided, I, I directed that for a lady called Mamie Jean. My brother starred in that with me. Now, that's a movie that went under the radar because this product, the sales company at the time kind of destroyed the sales. And it's unfortunate because, again, for filmmakers who bleed out their eyes to make films, yeah. they get taken advantage of their novices by these sales companies who make money on their films and they never get seen. But In the Eyes of the Killer slash Blindside, it is truly one of the best films I've ever made. It's an homage to Alfred Hitchcock, who was... Uh, I was obviously a huge fan of Alfred and I studied him um, profusely. And that's def that's a highly recommended film, Blindsided in the Eyes of the Killer. It's out there somewhere. And if not, anyone can contact me and we'll get you a copy because it's worth seeing. Um, <clears throat> so my brother joined, joined me on that as well. We've done three or four together and it's always great working with Costas. He brings so much to the table. Um, Kirst. I can just tell you a quick story in regards to filmmaking, one that I share. It was a nightmare of a film. We're under so much pressure. We had a huge crew, blah, blah, blah. And then you get to the monster. And, you know, for anyone who's made a horror movie, you have to pre-vet everything to a T. Mm -hmm. And we didn't. We didn't have the time because, you know, the studios have the time. They have the money. They pre-vet. They have the effects guys build the monster. They test it. They film it. They light it. They do the, You know, they do everything before they get the set. Well, unfortunately for the independent filmmaker, you do all that prep on set. Mm -hmm. so then when you've seen the curse that dude the monster dude whatever he is mm -hmm. well he, to me every time we were shooting him i was just saying freaking cut so no I'm not putting my name on this he looks terrible it's just shit i'm looking on the monitor i'm not buying it there's yeah. nothing real about it guys and as i'm doing this speech we're outdoors now with the cows and stuff there's a flash a rainstorm so the dude, the mom gets soaking wet and everyone gets a little wet. We couldn't do anything about it. We we're outdoors and it was just this flash storm. Now, <clears throat> this monster dude's wet from the rain and he stands in front of the monitor and I scream, that's it, mother flowers. I said, <laughs> he looked, it, it, all it needed was a spritz. So for like three weeks, we're shooting this monster that's driving me crazy and no one thought, just give it a little water spritz. So after it rained on him by the Lord's choice, so to speak, he looked beautiful. And from that day on, we would spritz the monster. <laughs> that's when we kept okay. filming with this monster. So I just thought that was a funny story. And that's yeah. independent filmmaking. That's what happens right, right. every day. It's like, oh my God, we'll so, do spritz this dude. Like a happy action, um, basically. <laughs> funny story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was. And then from that point on, we kept the design, we kept the monster and we kept filming. Yeah. So let, let, let's go back real quick with, uh, with, with some of your work here because because I know you've done other productions that you've, that you've worked on on set. I think really ever since you, because if I remember hearing correctly, ever since you have done uh, Martial Law, which I think if anyone doesn't really know, you were a part of that show back in the 90s. But ever since you've left that show, you really started getting more hands on with uh, the production side of it for yourself and starting to write direct and things of that nature. Uh, I think you gave a lot of credit from your experience working with 
all the Hong Kong guys, Stanley Tong, everybody else yeah. involved. Like that really kind of just like was the uh, the catalyst of like kind of getting that ball rolling for you. Um, and then from there, you started doing a lot more of like short films, and and, you, and from there, you started to build up with your with your uh, credits as far as uh, directing, writing, things of that nature. But another interesting thing that I also came across too with was uh, I had learned that you as re- you know, given your your art background, for anyone who doesn't know as well, that you are also a respective um, art. Uh, uh, you you paint, you draw. I mean, a lot of it you can come across on your website as well too. For anyone that doesn't know, that you are also storyboarding your own films as well. Uh, Correct your background. Um, and then at one point, I remember I heard you say that you, when you were a kid, uh, that you wanted to be a comic book artist for Marvel Comics when you were a child. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Fan. So I found that would be interesting, and you still kept that throughout the years as far as your artistic uh, endeavors That's are right. concerned. So, um, so I was curious is that, you know, with what, with what you have, um, with, after your years of working on films and then finally getting into the, you know, the production side of it and were you being hands-on? Cause to me, you, you, I get the feeling that you are very hands-on with just about everything you do when it comes to your productions. Um, and the storyboards kind of was an, a major indicator for me on that, where you are pretty much pre everything drawing everything out. Um, I've heard some stories that you had shared as well too, where, um, you know, you, I, I guess people may come across it as being kind of uh, intense when you work on, on your films. So I, I'm wondering if you can just share, share some insight as how all that started for you to where you are now and how that's evolved for you throughout the years. Um, have you heard I'm intense? Is that, is that, is that what the word? Well, here's a, here's, a, here's a story that I, uh, that I, I heard be. that, uh, that I, I thought was rather funny. And this is one that you had shared. Uh, it was, um, it might've been this movie smokers, if I'm not mistaken, it could have been that from one of the other movies. I can't remember which one it was, but the story that you had shared was that you were, um, you were shooting something and you were telling, you were, you're pretty much getting everyone on the go. And then the crew apparently the next day had quit and you pretty much have to take everything else yourself um, as a result of, I guess, uh, however you ran the production at that time. I'm not saying you, you were, I'm not implying that you were being mean to them. It wasn't that it was more or less just that you were, you were pretty much like, Hey, come on, we got to get moving. We got to keep things moving uh, quickly. And I guess they couldn't handle that pressure or they couldn't handle that intensity or that, that work pace that you have. And some of them quit. And then you just had to, roll with the world with the dices you had and, and continue on from there so when i heard that story my impression was that so you're you are you know what you want and therefore you know how you want to get it done and everyone else got to keep up that's kind of the impression that i got that you're 100 percent correct oh okay yeah it's happened on a few films um uh i think i, I think the one you may have heard was smokers it's, ha- it's happened on a few films when i'm helming i'm I'm not one for idle chit chat on film. It makes me crazy. Uh, my philosophy when I do symposiums or seminars are until you make a feature film, you don't understand that every second counts. Yeah. You know, you can think creatively as you want, but that sun is going up and it's coming down. And I've got to deliver the film to my producers and my investors. And you're here doing selfies, telling stories about when you were 15 years old at some bar. Quiet. You know what I mean? It's that sort of stuff. You think about this, it takes a grip an extra three minutes because he has a cigarette and calls his girlfriend on the way to get the C-stand. And he does that five times a day, you know, that's up. And then you've got your, your actors are in the trailer for like, you know, uh, 15 minutes longer than as a filmmaker, get a movie. It's going to be fun. It can be. And it generally is because me, I don't want to be anywhere except on a physical set. The post-production's, you know, one thing, but my love is the physical production is, it's creating this, you know, and that's hard and it's hard work and a lot of people don't get it. So, yeah, the story I think you heard was the first day of Smokers. We get to set and we start two hours late because the light guys didn't show up. I fired them on the spot. I said, F off, I'm getting other people. So we had a few practicals and I said, I'll deal with them. And the first day was, a, I think, a 17, 18 hour shoot day. It really was. I'm not even joking. I went nuts. And I said, anyone who doesn't want to be here, get out. Anyone who wants to stay, I'll look after you. Meaning, you know, you're going to get looked after, but I'm not losing this day. I'm not losing the schedule. And I said, if everyone wants to go home, I'll shoot it myself. You know, it was that type of attitude I have because making a movie is war. So I lost, I'd say 30% of the crew that day, but 
what we got was intense. What we got was unbelievably magical. Um, they said it was the greatest experience they've ever had in their life and they learned so much and to be, I'm, not, I'm not putting my own hand on my back I never do that but the people that stayed said we've never seen anything like that um, you know I'm, I'm over 50 now man I'm going like a truck so they the people with a little heart a little soul and a little intellect saw it a different way they were like wow look at this old dude spilling blood to make make his art and just going all night you know and it inspired them but yeah some people uh take it the wrong way and they said this is crazy i'm going yeah. so obviously you can't do that uh on all films but it was an indie i was the boss and i had the right to to make those decisions so i would not say i'm tyrannical at all and to be honest with you i'm quite the opposite i think i my philosophy is um, and I learned it from Sean Penn because Sean Penn is one of the best directors in town. He's just so great. And he did a movie with my brother called The Pledge uh, with Jack Nicholson. Great film. And I was talking to my brother. We're at the Four Seasons one day and Sean was there and whatever. And they were all talking. I was just having a drink listening. But he was really close with my brother and they were having a great conversation. And I remember at one stage, one of my first movies, the movie was called Jimmy Bones. And it was uh, an autobiography of my childhood. Really good film. And I remember there was an actor and afterwards we were drinking and I was saying, ah, you know, she didn't deliver. She couldn't get there. And I'm disappointed in her. I was saying all that sort of stuff. Cut to Sean Penn many years later, telling my brother, no, as a director, it's your responsibility to bring the best out in everyone from crafty to the crew, to the actors. It's my job. I'm, I'm, I'm the leader and I've got to bring the best out in you. So, that's why they call someone a director because you want to direct traffic here and if an actor's having a little trouble getting to where they need to be it's your job to help them not put them down get them there help them groom them work with them so i learned that from him um and i i believe in that so it's not that i change my ways i just grew up a little bit my my innate nature is to bring the best out in people so I think I'm pretty damn good to work with. And I'm also very prepared. I don't know many yeah. directors that do their lenses and their storyboards, have their ins and outs, their conceals, their reveals, and come with a book like this of three weeks of, you know, bleeding out my eyes, making the movie. As Hitchcock and Spielberg say, the movie's made before you get to set. Mm -hmm. And then the execution is the execution, of course. But if you don't know what's going on before you get there and you can't answer every question an actor asks about a moment or a character, you're in trouble. And I think... 50% of the time I'm working with directors that just I'm on set thinking, I mean, I bite my tongue not to just get up and get involved. Now, 50% of that 50% of the time, and I don't know if you've heard this, but hey, I'm not afraid to say it. You know, my friends call me switch for a reason. And uh, I switch. <laughs> I just, yeah, they do. <laughs> they they okay. got to know me pretty well. <laughs> and um, time's too short. This is what I do. This is my brand. This is our business. So I'm not yeah. going to sit here and say nothing anymore. I'm going to get up and say, hey, man, this is wrong. And I've done that a lot. And some directors don't like me for that. But um, I don't care. Well, so let, let's talk about that, because uh, here's the thing about uh, that I picked up on with you. Um, it actually, <clears throat> it was actually one of the your you actually posted it on your social media and as well as on your uh, YouTube channel where uh, I kind of picked up on your intensity because I think it was it, it might have been smokers. Uh, I think a lot of that I've seen uh, some of the behind the scenes stuff that I, I had come mm -hmm. across, you know, these stories were from those from that production. But uh, there was one in particular moment where, that uh, that I a, a, a production that I saw where you were choreographing a fight scene you had the camera behind you a certain way and the actor in front of you was up against the wall and you know you're doing your 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 choreography with them and then i mean you were sweaty to <laughs> from top to bottom um, i was in a white shirt by any chance yeah exactly you could see that it right was through. the day i was talking about that was the first day of oh, smokers. okay so okay. that's how i look there you go Dripped. okay yeah, yeah so yeah i saw that and so now it makes more <laughs> sense to me so i saw that and you know you're doing the choreography and then I mean, you mentioned switch. I, I I saw that where you were like, okay, all right. So are they ready? Are they ready? Okay, we're gonna go over here, here, here. I mean, it was just like a, like that. I, that I did not expect from you. And to be frank with you, I don't think I, I caught on at that time that you were actually directing the film until I learned it after the fact. So I was like, oh, so now it started making more sense to me. And that's when I started picking up some of the uh, your direction, if you will, of like how you like to manage the set. So when I saw that, I was like, yeah, this guy is intense, and I could see what, from that video how people may <laughs> get that get the wrong impression. Um, you know, I've, I've never done production of that sort of, by any means, but, 
I do know that um, you know you you have to run a tight ship. So based on what you describe, what you just explained here, that def that definitely does make sense, and it's actually a valid one too, because you know productions can be rather uh, shaky at times, and if you don't have everyone in order, you're obviously going to have a, a really tough time. I want to share something with you. It's really important for anyone who's in this business to kind of watch this. I just did a movie with uh, Liam Neeson here in Bulgaria. Yeah, I, I did a very small role, but I had the pleasure of working with this incredibly beautiful man. What a man, Mr. Liam Nielsen. Hugs and kisses, kind sir. One of the coolest grounded cats I've ever met. You know, you get on set with these big names sometimes, and we all know the story is sometimes they're just jerk offs, you know what I mean? And you just mm -hmm. want to pick them up, throw them through a freaking window, but you can't. So Liam was the complete opposite. He was just such an incredible human being, yeah? So we're on this set. Oh, God. I've, mm, the, the movie's called Memory. And if you want, you can check the director's name. I don't know his name offhand. I forgot it. But the director of this film, Memory. So we're on set. And um, people start chattering while we're rehearsing with, with Liam trying to work out this scene. And this guy immediately screams at the top of his voice says everyone shut the f up and he looked around and he says i'm sick and tired of people talking while the actors are rehearsing he says it's not fair the next person who says one if i hear a whisper i'm firing you on the f and spot does everyone understand that good action on rehearsal and i was like it's not just me why because it's a fine art and Crew has time to set their lights. Makeup has time to do their makeup. And it always seems to be, especially on the independent films where the actors get walked on. While we're rehearsing, everyone's talking and smoking and telling. It's like, no, now this is our time to prep what we do. We are, you know, helping the author, our director, tell this story. And we need absolute silence because it's a nuance. Filmmaking's a nuance. That's right. why in the best acting classes, you want to hear a pin drop. And I've been to some classes where the teacher's talking in the back on the phone, and I'm like, are you joking, lady? Anyways, this guy cemented the fact to me as a filmmaker, an aspiring filmmaker, that, yeah, there's certain ethical rules that are musts. And I used to feel bad when I used to say, guys, quiet, for fuck's sake. We're trying to make it. I used to feel a little bit guilty, like, mm -hmm. dude, you know. No, 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 no. And this guy cemented it for me. That's what we do. There's a time. The machine, the filmmaking machine, in my opinion, it's uh, a metaphor would be it starts up, boom, 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 boom. it starts up and the crew and blah, blah, blah. And you start building and it gets loud and it gets fast. And then, you know, it's all set. Then the actors come on and then doo, 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 doo. it hushes down to a fucking idol. Everyone stops. The actors do their stuff. They go to get dressed and then doo, 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 the V8 starts again. That's the machine. <laughs> well, the film that uh, the director talking about was actually Martin Campbell. Um, for anyone who doesn't know out there, um, yeah. that's that's the uh, director you referred to. This guy. Yeah. So he's great. Mar Martin Campbell, I think, is one of those directors that's kind of underrated, in my opinion, too. Um, really good director. He's um, done some big things, though, right? I mean, yeah, he's, he's done James Bond. He's done a few James Bond films. And, uh, yeah. you know, he's done quite a few major uh, productions uh, in Hollywood. Yeah. But again, he's one of those directors that, to me, um, you know, that's you. He has the talent. I think it's just one of the once in a while there's that one project that sticks out for him and then that's regains momentum. And then, you know, something along the way comes and, you know, you know, the business, it either works or it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and he's, I see yeah. him have that fluctuation in the career where he's got great work. And then there's other things along under the radar that most people don't realize uh, that he has done. So I'm glad you pointed out too, because what I was trying to get into as well was because um, there was actually an interview that I heard about that your brother had done. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, your brother Casas Mandalore is also an actor as well. But your brother uh, mentioned something about uh, him not wanting to direct, which kind of leads me to my question with you, because um, he was pointing out that, you know, I guess you you and your brother have a different approach in how when it comes to production, your brother just rather sticks with one aspect. You and the other hand are more hands on with 50 things going on at once. Um, and I can I, I appreciate listen, when I listen to that story, him sharing that story, but he's like, I I'd rather just do with the acting thing and then, you know, and deal with the other. Cause I'm not like my brother. My brother can do 50 things at once. I'm just focusing on one thing and I'd rather stick with that. Um, so and that, he's so good at that, man. He's so yeah. good when he, when he's invested, he's great. Sorry right. to interrupt. Go no, 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 that's fine. I'm glad you did because that's what I wanted to point out too, because um, you know, when, when I look at your brother's body of work, yeah, he's a very good actor as well. I can see where he's coming from. Um, but you know, again, only a handful of people can actually pull off, 
you know, the multitasking aspect of the production side. And uh, uh, which was fascinating to me about you as an actor, now as a director and writer and so on, uh, that when I started looking to your work, I started realizing, like, you know, you are involved with a lot of different projects, but a lot of the projects that you were also wor that you've worked on, you know, you were a producer in some capacity or you have uh, assisted in some way or shape or form either it, not just from the acting aspect, but also with choreography as well, too, which I know mm -hmm. you have done a lot of as well, uh, given your martial arts background. For anyone that doesn't know, um, you have a really pretty uh, storied athletic uh, a career because uh, you played soccer. Actually, I wrote down the name of the team here. So forgive me if I'm messing this up. You had played for uh, Heidelberg United Football Club out in Australia when you're uh, back in your back in Australia. Is that correct? Yep, that was one of them. That was one of them. Okay, okay. So yeah, and and right. so you you were you played professionally yeah. out there, and you also had a boxing career too. Which then yep. that's one of the reasons why you went over to L.A. shortly after your brother. But a lot of people thought that you had gone because you wanted to be an actor. But that it was the the exact opposite. You wanted to be a professional Correct. boxer. Acting just kind of came in uh, by accident along the way. So for anyone who hasn't heard the story, I recommend um, that you know they can hear that uh, <laughs> because I know you shared it quite a few times. But it's actually a really interesting one too. I, I must point out. But anyways, uh, so you know, with your with your background with the athletics, I know that that transition in for you to be able to learn how to choreograph and adapt with um, with a lot of the uh, um, the action side of it too, which you have done quite a few, especially in the last couple of years, especially since you've done uh, debt collectors. That's really where I started picking up more of your action roles along the way. So you know, what mm -hmm. I was trying to point out with you with your with regards to your brother and, and to this is that. Um, when when um when people when i when i look at your your career and i look at the at your body of work um it's it's amazing to me that you haven't worn yourself out because you've done just a bit of everything art music as well because i know you're also a musician as well in your own right um you know producing right so there's a lot that you've done that i i, I you know even for me it was kind of hard to keep up <laughs> and i'm just actually like observing you know from the standpoint so um I always wonder uh, where where you um, find the time to balance all that because even now, with, with as I'm talking to you, you're like in the middle of something at this point uh, with production over where you are at right now. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, I understand that it's very difficult and it can be very time consuming. Uh, and yet, you've given a guy like me a little time out of your day to to talk. But you know, I'm curious to see how you are able to manage that and balance that out because. Um, honestly, it's not, that's not a very easy, easy thing to accomplish and to do it for as long as you have, especially in the last couple of years where your career has escalated, in my opinion, where you are doing a lot more hands-on work. Um, so where do you, how, how did you learn to do that? Secondly, how did you develop to do that? And thirdly, how do you maintain that? Okay. I'll segue. Uh, I'll tell you something that I don't think anyone knows. I haven't shared an interview before is when I was boxing in Australia, um, my, my friend who was world champion at the time, Tosca Petridis, who was a kickboxer, we uh, used to work nightclubs and um, we got involved with the stunts. My friend Louis Travonovic, who I based the character on called Louis the Jaw with the show I made called Elwood, um, he ran New Generation Stunts at the time in Australia. So he said, you guys want to be stuntmen? And we said, yeah. So we went and did this stunt course and became professional stuntmen right when uh, Mission Impossible back then was filmed in Melbourne, Australia. It was in the mid 80s, mid to late 80s. And Mission Impossible went to Australia to film. And I started doing stunt work back then, right? So I did get a taste of the business, but I did all the fight scenes. I did all the backflips. I got, got hit by cars. I did high falls. So I was in the biz in a sense back then. Um, that led to uh, a little bit of knowledge, I guess. Hence, started the boxing, went to LA. And uh, I think after martial law, when I did the first season of martial law and absorbed all the long knowledge from the greats, that's when I made my first film, Jimmy Bones. I only did the first season of martial law. Right. So then I said to myself, let me make a feature film. Shot it on film. It was an homage to my childhood, all the, the gangster stuff in my childhood. It was pretty violent film. It was you uh, and your brother in the film too, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No one's ever seen it because I still, I think I'm going to release it sometime this year. Just I saw clips of it online, on if I'm not channel. mistaken. So there was some, mm, don't think so. I saw one Unless, clip. It was, you. it was, really? it was, yeah, it was in black and white, right? It's a black and white film. Unless it's a trailer. The, the only thing that that's what, that's what I'm referring to. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So um, it's a really good film, man. And I think I'm going to put it out there this year. Uh, but okay. nonetheless, look, man, um, being an actor, as you know, you're not always working. 
So there's a lot of downtime. And um, people who know me, I'm not good with downtime, man. So <laughs> I'm just one of those cats. Granted, I like to relax. I do. There's nothing more I like to do than get up and have a have a ciggy in the morning and, and you know, ride my, my Harley to the beach and chill out. But an hour later, I'm bored with myself. I want to go and do something. You know what I mean? Right, I can't. Right, right. So... Um, you know, man, passion precedes anything. And I love what I do. I love to, to sketch and paint. I love to write music. I've got an album coming out next week, by the mm -hmm. way. I'm dropping it on TuneCore. And this is for your clip. movie Smokers, am I right? Is that what Yeah, part of it's for the movie Smokers. Oh, okay. And then I did a film in Russia about two years ago, and it was about an aging rock star. And I made a deal with the producers. I said, give me a chance to uh, write the score. And they said, okay. And I wrote a couple of songs and they said, oh, you know, what? You did not write this. I said, yeah, yeah, I did. So when I got to set, they hired a Russian band to be my band in the movie, you know? Mm -hmm. So we're there for 10 days making this movie. And in between all the setups, me and the band would just jam. Lo and behold, we became good friends. And um, the magic man, Artem, the, the leader of the band and I wrote an album and i um, just real proud of it man it's coming out next week um, and what's the name of the album called again uh, at the moment the working title is called east meets west and that's the thing man um i travel with guitar and sketchbook um i find that i'm in a lot of and i'm very lucky to be working as you know in this crazy business i'm, I'm absolutely blessed uh, granted i've worked hard for it but you know I'm, I, I feel like i'm barely tipping the iceberg to be honest i'm not happy yet i want to keep climbing this ladder and so forth but you know i do a lot of traveling and um while i'm traveling i'm writing thinking ideas over the years we've made a lot of connections through peers and i'm pitching shows to networks we had a great pitch season last month um pitching to netflix and sony with some ideas so i think as time goes on you meet more people and if you have a little motivation and some um creativity going on inside there's always something to pursue right so I guess the answer would be I like to pursue things. And as you know, in life, some stick, some don't, but I'm, I'm constantly active creatively. I've learned that I like giving birth to things. It's very feminine, I know, but uh, uh, I'm not worried. Yeah, I'm not worried. Um, uh, it's actually a wonderful thing. I've learned to trust that side of me. So, you know, I'm great at creating story and ideas and, and, and working out puzzles. Uh, I have some writers that help me actually write the scripts because I do not write the actual screenplays. I'll just co-write and, and uh, oversee, but writing a screenplay is a specific job. So I'm always doing something when, you know, when I have the time. Um, yeah. As an actor, you have a lot of downtime, so you yeah. do your best to try and fill it. Well, so here's the thing that I um that I'm also uh, picking up with you as well. Um, one of the most consistent things I've heard about you, uh, from just about everybody that has worked with you that I've come across as far as like interviews or whatever else, um, is that you know Scott Atkins. Is, I'm mean, using I use him as an example. Um, there's an inter there's a video that he had done for his channel, where he was talking about with you know who he's worked with and so on and and one of the actors that he's named that really made him step up his A game was you. After oh, having, really? Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. That's great. Yeah, he really said that. Uh, it was it was in one of the videos. He was doing the ranking of like some of like his top top five films, and he threw your name in there as well, saying that you know I've worked with a few actors, but there's only two, at least at that time, that he had mentioned that he's worked with so far that had come to mind that had really made him step up his uh, his A game, and you were the two actors he had mentioned at that time. Um, Fantastic. Because he had uh, realized that you know the again the intensity you brought into your role. Uh, for anyone who hasn't heard the story that when you first worked on Deck Collector, you were pretty much in character from the moment on you got onto the set. Uh, That's which, a great story. Yeah, it's a, it's yeah, a fun one of so my do you, would, you, would you mind sharing that for, for anyone who doesn't know? Because yeah, I'll make I've, it quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll make it quick. <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's a classic. So when they were casting for Sue, it was yeah. a, a big look-see because it was an important character, obviously. And, right. you know, they were nervous to make the choice because it was a make or break the film, obviously. And um somehow some way they showed faith jesse and and scott decided to give me a shot so i worked real hard on that preparation and i took a big risk and i made him real nasally a little punchy mm. and i wanted him to whisper and be almost inaudible and my intention was to have people like lean in to the tv like 
you know, what's he saying? Yeah. <laughs> and I just felt like that would engage them. And I said to myself, it doesn't matter if they understand me or not. It's just, that's him. And they get, I don't even have to say anything. They, they get my character type thing. That was my uh, breakdown. So we get to set first day, huge set, all the producers behind the monitors more than should be. And you know, it was just a pack set and there was pressure and no one was having fun. It was 7 a.m. Right. The sun was up. It was like a hundred plus already at 7.30 yeah. in yeah. LA in the middle of summer. <laughs> And I've got these two pages like this of like this crazy dialogue, you know, 10 for two and a hundred and this and this and a dip. But the book, but if you remember that yeah, scene, yeah, when the big scene, we go yeah. in and we fight the two big uh, uh, black dudes, you know, it yeah, was yeah. right before uh, we go into Harvey's. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So Jesse says, all right, well, everything's set. Let's do one. And we did the take. And here I am going, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm doing yeah. all this stuff. I'm, like, you know, I'm, like, I'm doing my mumbling. We yeah. do the see everyone doing this behind the monitor and doing this and then jesse runs around to my thing scott gets out of the car it's like just this weird vibe and yeah, i'm yeah, like yeah. oh fuck they hate it they <laughs> hate it i'm done and then jesse comes to the window he kneels down and he's so polite he's like hello louie mate this is um are you all right to do another one <laughs> i said yeah of course man. yeah come on let's go so he goes back we do another one and after the second take the energy was completely different everyone yeah. started this everyone started going home all the yeah. big bosses started going home now the set the set thins and scott comes back in the car and he sits down and he looks at me he goes all right son energy complete because i haven't met scott the first right, time right. i met him was yeah, on yeah. the set the first right. morning right <laughs> so you know scott atkins is no joke right if you haven't worked with him and you just met him he's i mean serious if you're not doing your job you're gone yeah. <laughs> no joke um yeah. And um, Jesse comes around again and he says, oh, you fucker. He says to me something like that. And I'm like, what's happening? He says, we all just realized you're acting, son. You took the game up through the roof. So he <laughs> said to everyone, get your shit together. We've got an actor on set. Because oh, right. they all thought I was dying. <laughs> right, right, right. Scott said to me afterwards, buddy, I didn't think you'd make it through the next day. Yeah. <laughs> then we realized you're doing all the same coughs at the same beats. And this is the character type thing. Yeah. So uh, from, from that second on, it was it was full steam ahead. Right. So, and so, uh, so what I was, it's, that's, I'm glad you shared that because uh, one, one other thing too, I think if I heard correctly and let me know if I'm wrong, um, you, I think that was the time that you were trying to be really full method at that point. And if I'm not mistaken, right. Uh, during the set, cause I think, I think Jesse had advised you not to do something like to that effect where, you know, was you just a lot, you just landed in LA, you were jet lagged and you decided to use that momentum to, to kind of basically, use as a driving force for your character sue on on the, uh, in the film and and then i remember you were exhausted by that point where you couldn't maintain that uh that method of acting if you will and you decided to kind of just take a break from that at least on the set uh, unless i've heard that wrong yeah no not true I, okay. i've never done method in my life oh, okay, i'm okay, not a okay. method actor but um what i do lately is it's so interesting because I talk about this with some of my friends. Um, I never do the method thing. I can't. It doesn't work for me. You know, it's, okay. It's why? It's cool. It's, to me, I'm one of the guys that say it's acting. I can turn it on. But obviously, there's a lot of preparation. And there's a lot of a lot of efforts that go into just turning it on. But lately, it's not method. I'll I'll stay in character in a sense when I go home. But I'm not going to do the voice and the mumbling and have the accent. It's just inside me. I'm, I'm still this aggressive kind of, and people who are with me at the time, living with me, let's say, um, they notice that I've got a short fuse and I don't talk as much. And I'm not the same jovial Lewis telling stories, but I'm still me, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. I think method is when you don't break character at all. Yeah, like, like Daniel Day Lewis. Call you, call you by the character name. And, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no. So, um, no, never got tired. Um, I mean, I was exhausted just from the physicality of the shoot and the effort, but uh, no, I kept at it, kept at it through okay. the whole thing. DC too was rough because I had a back injury. Uh, I started that movie because I was training for that movie. I actually wanted to get in real good shape and about five days before the movie, because I was training so intensely, I hurt my lower back so bad. I could hardly walk every morning. So I did all of DC too with a horrible injury. It was so painful. But um, somehow, some way that, you know, it comes across. Well, as you couldn't a, tell. You, know, and a, you really couldn't tell. 
at all because it, it seemed that was part of your character's uh you know care you know attributes yeah. where you know the, you gotta the, use it the age was catching up and you know i thought that was very yeah. fitting for the character so yeah you fooled yeah. me i so i didn't pick up on that at all well so i mean again like there's there's qu quite a few things that i like i said before that i i found really interesting about you uh that I think a lot of people don't realize that you are like endrenched in pop culture, but you're like, you're, you know, underneath the radar for some people who may not pick up on that. But one of the things that I've come across here too, about you as an actor is that you're actually one of the very few people in Hollywood that's actually got to work with the two Stallone brothers. Um, you actually got to work with both Frank and Sylvester, uh, which was a, a very um, interesting for me because uh, I'm a big Sly fan. Uh, and to me, he's, he's my favorite actor of all time. But you've worked with him before on Rambo Last Blood, but you also worked with his brother, Frank, on the film that you did called Sex Trip, if I'm not mistaken. Which is a good little film. Not many people it was. Know that. A, yeah. Did it's you a, enjoy it? I did enjoy it. Very, very fun movie. I had a blast with it. I loved your character. A um, little twisted yeah. guy, in my opinion. I mean, he makes the movie. <laughs> yeah. He's Sorry. a little twisted. In my, he's a little twisted, your character, uh, in the film. Oh, he absolutely. Yeah, yeah. He's sick. He's sick. But <laughs> so, um, that's a movie that... I highly recommend that because yeah. as far as comedies go, you know, it's, look, it's sticky. It is yeah. what it is. It's a yeah, pretty yeah, yeah. simple linear story. It's been yeah. done before, but it's funny. And at the end of the day, you want to watch a comedy to actually laugh. And this yeah. movie, I guarantee people will laugh, right? I mean, I love I, it. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, but what, <laughs> what I was, uh, when I was watching the movie though, um, yeah, I, I enjoyed the film, but it wasn't when, when I saw the scene that you had done with Frank, which was like one little second in the movie. Yeah. And I was like, oh, you've worked yeah. with Frank too. He's like, you know, only a handful yeah. of people can actually say that uh, uh, yeah. in the industry. So I thought that was very interesting because I know you, like I mentioned before, you worked with Sly on uh, um, uh, Rambo Last Blood, which um, I didn't know it was you at the time um, because you're, you are so, I, I didn't recognize you at all. You had the hat, you had the <laughs> accent, you had the glasses, you looked a lot older. Uh, in the and I was kind of talking like that. Thanks, right, John. exactly. Right. <laughs> so I, I, I found that to be rather interesting that you were able to um, to be so uh, you, know, you, you were able to pull out this chameleon act where I didn't even recognize it was you uh, as an actor cool. with a Benjamin. Uh, I didn't even know that was you in the movie as well, because you had a bald head. Um, you have more of a, a, a standard. I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm Australian. Wrong. You are. You still you stuck with the Australian accent there. OK, that's what For that one. Yeah. So uh, it was, so I, I wanted to ask you about something real quick with regards to accent, because um, uh you know with debt collectors uh obviously ramble last blood you've you've you changed your accent even with uh because i even put in a chicago accent if i'm not mistaken too with uh big fat greek wedding as well yep uh and uh, i'm curious because um you know i you know I, I listen to your accent now you can i can tell it's a bit watered down because your australian accent um was isn't nowhere near as strong as it was you know when you first correct that's right so but when you've done certain roles uh where you have cranked up your Australian accent with, with movies like The Mercenary, Sinners and Saints. Um, and of course you do other accents with, with many other productions. Um, so this is more like a two-putter for me. So is it, is it, is it as difficult for you to, to put back your native accent uh, whenever you are doing roles that, that you either want to put the accent on or it's required for you to put it back on? To be honest with you, I love accents. I, I love experiment, experimenting with them and um, the more I can do, the more I shall, because it's just great. Right. And you said something earlier real quick. And um, with character acting, a leading man is a leading man. You've got to do what you've got to do. But for these characters like Benjamin and like Rambo, my objective is to have people say, who is that? And I love the fact that you didn't recognize me in both of them, because that's my intention. I want people to not know it's me. That's the whole point about me as an actor is you want to fill the shoes of this person's life. And I don't want everyone to say, oh, that's Louis Mandalore in another movie. I want him to say, who is that? No, you know, it's not Louis. So yeah, that's yeah, yeah. job well done for me. That's my job. Um, the hardest thing to do, believe it or not, bro, is to do my native accent because I spent 30 plus years getting rid of the Australian and doing New York and, you know, mid the hardest, no, actually the hardest thing is to do the neutral Midwestern. Like, you know, hi, how are you? The Californian R A E I O U type thing. That is really difficult. But New York, you know, hey, Dawn, anyone can do a New York accent. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's the Australian going back to my roots. It's the hardest thing to do for some reason, man. Why is that for you? I've been thinking about it. I don't know. It's just, it is what it, it just is. It's just hard to just get back and just do a normal Aussie accent, bro. And it's like, it's so difficult for what? me. 
but is it you? Do you have to put on? Are you put? Because I, I, I mean, I've only met a handful of Australians, and I know there's different Australian accents. If anyone doesn't know, but um, are you trying to put like more of a standard Australian accent? Or are you putting a, like a, a, a regional uh, Australian accent? Well, well, for my work, you mean when I do the yeah, when you do yeah. your work, yeah. Well, you know, it's specific. Like the cop in in London, he lives in London, and he's an Aussie, and he, you know, got a transfer, so um, I adapted avengement to what i would perceive as this guy being an aussie living in england for many years so you know it's my perception i rolled the dice on it so it's all specific the uh aussie mercenary he was real ocker mm -hmm. so if you hear avengement he's a little more refined but in the mercenary it was like come on mate you know what you're getting mm -hmm. soft on me buddy you know that's real aussie innuendos uh so it's all it's all relative but just to sound like i'm from somewhere in australia <laughs> it's the hardest thing for me to do and right. that's actually where I'm from. Yeah. Um, I, th I think it's something to do with shying away from it for 30 years, you know, and just getting rid of it. And I think psychologically now going back, there's just something there, but it's okay. I'll, I get there, but it's not easy. Well, you would think it's the easiest, right? Right. It's well, not. It, it dawned on me because I, because that's the thing I've, I've come, I've listened to quite a few Australians that worked in, in the industry for a number of years and um, they've moved away from Australia. And then when they, one of the stories that I've heard that's consistent is that when they go back to Australia, having been away for such a long period of time, they notice that the accent is nowhere near the same as it was as they yeah. thought it would because they've been away for for so long that you know you hear some many actors may you know the, the accent's kind of watered down a bit, uh, but yours in particular was the one that I noticed the most. Your brother's accent is practically gone at this point. I mean, once in yeah. a while you can hear a little bit come out, but that's very rare. But you yeah. for some reason are, are able to maintain some of it. Uh, which is fascinating for me because I, I always find that very interesting for actors that still maintain an accent of their of their native uh, um, country, but for whatever reason they uh, like you mentioned, you're able to come back into it, but it's difficult for you. That's one of the most common things. So I was curious how you approach so, that. But let's get into something real quickly because um, I like I said before, I've come across a lot of uh, things you've done, and I've come to realize the uh, the amount of work you've done with people in the industry, directors, writers. Um, producers actors and so on and i've actually wrote uh, quite a few uh names down here that i've was curious if you could um uh, share some insight on here because i've i've worked I've, I've realized how many people you've worked with in the industry that maybe you may not know by name but in some way or shape or form they're very uh, um, integral in the industry uh one of which is the um is of course uh the director joel zwick uh who we've worked with before on my big fat greek wedding and for anyone that doesn't know the name, I'm 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 not sure. I'm sure you may be familiar with him, but he is very very entrenched in the entertainment industry, having worked on some of the most major um, television series of all time. Uh, you know, he's got uh, Full House, Family Matters, Mork and Mindy, Bosom Buddies, uh, just to name a few. And and you've also got a chance to work with Mark L. Lester with the film White Rush, which I actually which I actually happen to see as well too that you worked with on with Judd Nelson. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know Mark Lester, uh, Mark L. Lester. Uh, Commando, um, Firestarter, Showdown, Little Tokyo. I mean, you've worked with some people that, you know, for me, I, as a film lover, I, I find that fascinating because you've got to work with these uh, these directors and you've also got to work with a number of other actors as well, too, that um, I, you know, they have history in the industry. Um, and in one film that you actually did that really caught me by surprise because I didn't know if I was actually going to like it, to be completely honest with you was a movie that you had done called The Sensei and which was directed by D Diana Lee uh, in, in Osanta, who is the daughter of Dan in Osanta, who is um, one of uh, Bruce Lee's uh, students and really good friends and family friend. And you worked with him on that, I'm sorry, you worked with her on that film. And you've also worked with her too, with her too if I'm not mistaken, with the movie that you had done with her, uh, that you had done called uh, Sinners and Saints, where she was a stunt coordinator, if I'm not mistaken, on, the, on that set as well too, am I right? Uh well, first of all, Diana Lee and her husband, Ron Balicki. I don't know if you know anything about Ron, her husband. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, they're, they're dear friends, uh, uh, some of the most beautiful people I've ever met in my life, mm -hmm. and I really love them dearly. And they've been really good to me, and they were uh, obviously gracious enough to have me play uh, the role in The Sensei. And uh, what a film. I mean, heavy film. She's an incredibly yeah. talented writer-director, that lady. And uh, I think she's, she's coming up. Ron is one of the best martial artists in the world. I'm not sure if you know that, uh, but he is, yeah, he is just fascinatingly brilliant with his martial arts and an incredible human being. So two dear friends, and they were both involved in Sinners and Saints, but I I was uh, just acting on that. So right, right, right. I, uh, I, uh, I'm not sure what 
if who, what and who I know. I think she was like an assistant I, I, start coordinator too. Cause if I'm not mistaken, wasn't her husband. Who coordinated? The, was her husband coordinator? I believe yeah, so. Ron, I could. Yeah, I think so. That's and right. I think she was Ron, the assistant yeah. if I'm not of mistaken. Course. Yeah. yeah. They do it together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, again, like I'm, I'm bringing out these names here because uh, again, these are for me, for someone who, who, who is a film lover that love that looks into the history. Um, as you can tell, as I'm looking into your career, um, I, I'm looking across and I see that the, the number of people you've worked with, um, and it's quite a, a storied career that you have because, I mean, with the, just on the name, just on the actors alone, I've already mentioned Frank, uh, St Frank and Sylvester Stallone, but of course, you've also worked with Van Damme, uh, Gary Daniels, uh, David Spade, Cuba Gooding Jr., uh, obviously Neo Vardolis, uh, Luke Goss, uh, Robert Logan. If you haven't who, seen, if, if you've seen the Cuba movie, uh, Wrong Turn of Tahoe. I, that one I didn't. I saw uh, one hand in the, I think one in the chamber, which is one another. One in the chamber. I did two with Cuba. Yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah. Um, and that's a Will Kaufman movie too. That that uh, that was uh, one in the chamber. Yeah, yeah, one mm -hmm. in the chamber. Great film. The Wrong Turn of Tahoe. The reason I bring that up is though because I did a really cool fight scene with Cuba, and um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I didn't see that and movie. You seen I, that? No, I I, saw, I did see the clip that that you that Scott had shared with you on his show, uh, The Art of Action. You guys did discuss that on there. Uh, I was aware of that movie, but I just never got a chance to see it. Um, yeah, but I, I'm fully aware of what what that was. I actually thought that was a, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I thought that was a Will Coffin movie too. Am I am I wrong in that? No, no, no. Okay, okay. Um, so yeah, I get you know I mentioned Cuba Gooding Jr. Um, you know you've got, and then you've also worked with other actors who I think, in my opinion, are really underrated and deserve a lot of attention, but. Uh, and I'm hoping that with the upcoming films that, or people that the films have already been released already, well, people will pick up on that. And that is Johnny Strong. I became a big Johnny Strong fan ever since I saw Sinners and Saints. And I saw that movie because of you. Uh, but then I saw Sinners and Saints, and then I ended up watching uh, Daylight Sin, which I love. That's one of my new favorite films I've seen the last couple of years. To me, to be frank with you, that's Will Coffin's best movie. Uh, and then I say The Brave is his next one. Um, and I know he's got another up, up, upcoming project with uh, Johnny that's coming out next year called uh, War yes. Wars One, which I'm yes. very, very excited for. I trust anything that Will does. Uh, yeah. I'm very excited for because I trust his uh, his uh, choices. In absolutely, film. no. The guys, the guys, absolutely amazing. Yeah. So funny I'm, you bring, go on. It's funny you bring up Johnny. It's funny you bring up Johnny Strong. Um, did you want to ask something about him, by the way? So Johnny Strong to me is like one of those guys that's you know. He's a throwback from the '70s, you know, Clint Eastwood, uh, Steve McQueen, those type of guys. I want you to share with me with him because uh, you worked with him twice before, Sinners and Saints, and of course, in Daylight Sand, which I love your performance in Daylight Sand. I love that movie. I, I, I movie. truly, truly love that film. Um, if I were to ask, if anyone were to ask me what's one of your new favorite films in the last couple of years, I'd say Daylight Sand. It's like in my top five because Beautiful I film. love that movie. And they're not an easy film to make, too, from what I can. But to me, that's one of uh, Will's uh, strongest films, but it's also one of Johnny's best as well, too. Um, yeah. But, I mean, I'm going off on a tangent here. But, uh, yeah, I was hoping you can share some insight with your, your, with your experiences with Johnny because sure. uh, he is amazing, sure in my thing. opinion. Uh, I'll segue, right? So yeah. you say Daylight Zen was hot and bothered. Because um, it was like over 100 you know, degrees I while you guys were shooting that. A lot more than that, and yeah. the same and ma matching humidity, and yeah. we had the lights, and then we had the clothes. Yep. So you know, I have never shared this story, but so be it. I'm going to share it today. I um I've been doing this nearly forty years now, and I've never ever stopped production. I've never, I mean, I always hurt myself, but I never stop. I never get sick. I nearly died on that movie How halfway so? through production. Yeah, no one knows this story. I'll share it with you. Um, halfway through production because everyone was freaking almost dying now some people tend to think i'm this party boy right okay and um this was one of those it's just murphy's law in life you know i wasn't i wasn't partying at all i don't do that when i film i really don't um nonetheless uh there was a lot of talk like oh he was partying and whatever but no it's all bullshit what happened was is uh, I was just tired from a previous job because I backed to back it. So we got to do daylight sand and uh, I didn't have any time to, to climatize or relax, went straight into shooting. And the first four days were me and Johnny doing all that running stuff, 110 humidity and blah, blah, blah. And there was a scene in the stairwell where uh, the beautiful Gary Cairns Jr. has to go by himself and he wakes him up and they all attack, but as we're in the stairwell, was my close-up, mm -hmm. I just dropped. 
dehydration. I had kidney failure. I was hydrating. I was doing everything right. But I learned a lot about water and hydration from the doctor, Mr. John Markowitz. After that, I was in hospital for two weeks, man. And they said, you're probably never going to come out of this and you're going to have one of those machines and whatever. But God bless. I was really lucky. Not only did I come out of the uh, kidney failure, but I'm, I'm back to normal, but it nearly did me in. So I had to stop production. And that was the most horrible experience, obviously, I've ever had in my life. And I don't think Johnny was too happy. No one was happy because who wants to stop production, you know? Obviously, they're all so sweet. They cared enough for my health and uh, I recovered. Uh, we reset a date and we finished the film and everything was fantastic. But that's how hot it was, man. That movie nearly did me in for real. Um, what I realized is uh, through my research is when you're already susceptible and you're already a little dehydrated, drinking bottled water because it's acidic, uh, it doesn't hydrate you. You only hydrate, I think, 10 to 15 percent. The rest just comes out in your urine when you go to the bathroom. So I wasn't hydrated enough and it caught up with me. And that's a fact. So alkaline water from now, I, I, since then, I almost only drink alkaline water wherever I can find it. Uh, because of that, because it's malleable, you know, you absorb the uh, the nutrients in the water. It doesn't go to the stomach and digest and get get peed out, you know. So that's what I learned. Um, as far as Johnny Stronger, um, let me tell you something about Johnny. Not only is he really a real martial artist, I mean, he's a black belt mm -hmm. jiu-jitsu. You know, he's a big boy and he's a health fanatic. He's a, he's a real character. The thing about Johnny is he probably says no to more jobs than any actor I know. Have you noticed he only does the movies he wants to do? Yeah, and, I picked up on that pretty early on. And the reason I'm glad you brought his name up is because I appreciate uh, the innate gift of acting. It's hard, man. It's hard. And not many people can really deliver a performance. Now, through my travels this year, funny enough, I'm watching cable late at night. Happened two times in the last couple of months where I'm watching these old, one was a Seagal movie. Mm -hmm. And there's this young, beautiful teenager looking dude who has the gun in the classroom i don't remember the movie if the, glimmer seen that movie. the glimmer man the glimmer i don't know so yeah. i'm watching was that with keenan ivor wayans right the, the other actor I, that was I, with... I, i'm not sure because after johnny's scene was over i changed the channel oh. <laughs> but um <laughs> okay um i have seen the movie it was pretty good but when i saw it i didn't know johnny but now that i know johnny so the point i'm trying to make here is early in johnny's career he's doing these character character acting roles and he's genius. The guy's one of the best actors in town, but he just refuses to work on movies he doesn't want to work on. Mm -hmm. But that guy has got chops. Now, for anyone who hasn't seen it, go watch The Glimmer Man, that opening scene. One of the hardest things to do as an actor is be the crazy guy with the gun. To really make it believable. Hey, I'm going to kill you all. It's the hardest thing to do and sell it and have people believe that you're really, you know, flipping out and you're going to suicide. And not only does he do it convincingly, he does it brilliantly. So that guy's a real actor and he's a real martial artist and he's one of the straightest guys I've ever met. I've got a lot of respect for Johnny and um, I'm just appreciative that, because I think he and Will collectively <laughs> make yeah. decisions who's, who's in their movies. And uh, Johnny's always uh, uh, okayed me to participate. So I love him for that. And he's, he's a real talent, that guy. Yeah, I, I agree too. I think uh, Johnny, like for me, because uh, Will is the one that pointed out he's he, he's a uh, you know he's he, he, basically to me like Johnny was almost in a way born in the wrong era because if he was born back in the seventies, I'm sorry, if he was alive in the seventies, you know, at this age, he would have been Clint Eastwood, uh, Steve McQueen. You know? I, I was going over with actors here that you've worked with. Um, of course, uh, on Daylight Send, you've worked with the legendary Han Lance Hangerson, who you play his son in the movie. Um, so, you know, Lance is one of those actors for me that is a, um, I don't know if people consider him to be an underrated actor, but I know a lot of people who are fans of, you know, films will recognize him as being one of the best in the business. Um, and this movie certainly for me uh, showcases a lot of the, the things that he, where a lot of his strengths are. Um, and that role, in my opinion, when I first saw it, it could have gone wrong in so many ways where if it wasn't cast, if, if the right person wasn't casted in the part, you know, probably the film wouldn't, wouldn't have been as strong. And uh, you know, like I said before, I, I trust Will and everyone else involved when they work on the project, they bring the right people involved and they trust that the actor will bring out their A game. Um, I, I know that when he was on set, um, you know, along with everybody else, I, you know, he was sweating up a storm as well too. 
uh because virtually every scene he's in he's you know covered in, in <laughs> covered in sweat so um i'm curious to, to have have you um <laughs> indulge some information on him because you have uh you had quite a few scenes with him and some of the best scenes in terms of like the, the more emotional aspect of it did involve you and him, which wasn't a whole lot of it. Uh, but the one scene in particular that, that I took away from that was really one of the strongest that said everything about you guys was the stairwell scene before you went off with Johnny uh, to, to uh, you know, to find the, the nest and whatnot. Um, you know, and again, that couldn't have, that scene wouldn't have worked well if you, you know, I know you're going to bring your A game, but obviously Lance will bring his A game too. But, if you guys didn't really bring that 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 added element of just by the body language, the facial expressions, to read the relationship right there, you knew where the where the two characters stood with each other, and then you leaving, and then him standing there, you know, waiting. You obviously wanted to say something, but he's such an old school type of guy that, you know, he's stuck in those ways, but he knows he wants to open up, but he, he's refusing to do it because, you know, for whatever those reasons may be. Um, so I was I'm curious. Not sure. Sorry, I'm not sure if it came across, but what made that whole relationship, I'm, 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 it was all in the writing. I, I, I actually don't remember if it was in the writing or we created it, but uh, myself and Chelsea, the lead actress with William, we discussed mm -hmm. the fact that she was dating my brother. She was with my yeah. brother who gets killed in the opening scene. But I always loved her. I don't know if you got that. She, she was the love of my life. And that scene where I was getting ready to go, we, we didn't want to hit it on the nose, but if you watch it, you can see that I'm crazy for her and she, yeah, you know what? I'm not sure what I, that I was sort what of, it was about. Because, I yeah. sort of picked up on that. Um, but I never really uh, pushed too my thought into it. It was one of those things where like, Oh, I wouldn't surprise me if he, it did cross my mind. The, I think the second time I saw it, uh, and I've seen it quite a few times, but when I saw it, I, I, I did pick up on that, but I didn't, again, I didn't put too much thought into it because I just assumed that it was one of those things that either I picked up on that, I'm kind of formulating the stories myself because, you know, you, you can usually read some things, but sure. nothing's been nothing's definitive. So you don't really have a solid, um, you know, backstory to really kind of get, have that told to you. But that's one of the reasons why I love this movie, too, because, you know, you know, there's there is exposition at times, but a lot of times it's just simply body language. And it's just the the interaction that the characters have where you have the whole story right there in front of you and yeah. you can just pick up from there. And I also think that. Uh, with your performances in Lance, which I was, uh, which I was starting up here, that that scene in particular really solidified like the whole film in a nutshell. Where um, you know it's there's a group of people who have worked, who are together in this situation, this traumatic situation, but they don't they don't have their problems resolved. So it's you know that's kind of like secondary for them at that point. Um, and that's why I found the, that movie to be so interesting because it, it is action horror post apocalypse. I, I, it is all those things, but. To me, it's a very character-driven movie, um, and it's one of the best ones of the genre, in my opinion. So, if people, were, if I would, if I would rate, if I were to recommend the film, what's a good post-apocalyptic film? Daylight Sin will come to mind. And I said, but it's not; it's more than that. It really is a solid course, yeah. character piece, um, and everyone, in yeah, my opinion, does a great job. Yeah, there's always, like you said, whatever the movie is—a horror movie, whatever. It's always the without the relationships and the subtleties it's never really you know, there's nothing going on yeah. i'll tell you one of my favorite movies i recommend this to everyone it's called uh i think it's called strangers Liv tyler you seen that one her, oh, and her yeah. husband yeah, yeah. they have yeah. real problems yeah scott's being and Liv tyler now yeah. that um, what a film i said i watched that with him because the directing the acting it was just so amazing and the opening Obviously, correct me if I'm wrong, I haven't seen it in a while, but they've got this dysfunctional marriage. I think they're on the way out. They're getting a divorce. I think so, They go to a party. You can see it's dysfunctional. Yeah, and they, they end up going to this cabin to try and reconcile, and they're fighting and arguing, and they're, it's just, you, it makes you go, oh, God, life, relationships, you know, and you really care for these characters. It's got nothing to do with a horror movie. It's these two people who are trying to rekindle their, their relationship and their love, and right. then all of a sudden, there's that knock on the door. So... Mm -hmm like daylight sand there's so much going on where like lance more or less disowned me in his heart because i was responsible in a way for the bright you know i was the second tier brother the not loved uh so, sorry son and um he wished it was me yeah. rather than than him and i know yeah. that and i'm living and he's you know i mean that's that's what carries the movie then you have the people trying to kill us so with those layers that's i think what makes a great horror film 
when you've yeah. got the, the story, you know, without the story, what do you have? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Um, but I mean, again, that, that movie, I, I, I can't sing enough praise about the film because when I, when I first saw it, I was like blown away, uh, how, how good that movie really is. <laughs> but then you come to find out too, uh, which is another thing I want to get into with you because, uh, which I'm going to use as a segue. So I, you know, that, that is a independent movie, low budget film, but Will's movies never feel that way at all. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever I watch his movies, uh, I know they're low budget films, but like one of the biggest examples for me that I really got that impression with him was when you, with the film that you worked with, uh, with him on um, uh, The Brave. And I mean, that movie, it looks very epic. Um, it has, you know, it has a, some great, great uh, shootouts. Will's, whenever it comes to Will's movie, I trust that his shootout scenes are going to be some of the best I've seen. Um, you know, I, I don't mean to say this to, to, to kind of uh, categorize it in a level, but, you know, considering, that, you know, mo all of his, most of his films are, are independent movies, low budget films. But in my opinion, some of them, they, they are superior to some of the more mainstream ones that we see uh, in, the, in, the, in the industry right now. Um, so I, I always pictured that, you know, if this guy's given the right project full control, he's going to make some of the best films and action films or whatever the case may be that we'll ever see if given the opportunity. But, you know, since, uh, you know, Will is, I, I think in some ways probably prefers being full control. When I look at this movie, um, this is an example of like, um, you know, this is like a hidden gem for me. Like, I love the film, The Brave. Like I truly like that movie made me a Will Coffin fan. Um, How's that last half hour of action, man? Is that I not the most intense? I love that scene so much. I, I kind of liken it to like I, I went through a big jog and the jog nearly killed me. And then I sat down, <laughs> someone brought me a cup of water and they said, you know, or you know, a bottle of water and said, here you go, man. You know, you know, it was a, it's a good experience, right? Yeah. Okay, don't worry. We're done for today. That's how I felt about that particular lead up to that scene. Um, so you know, I, I I recommend the film for anyone who hasn't seen it because it is available on Netflix right now for anyone who hasn't seen the movie. Truly, truly underrated film, in my opinion. Um, and like I said before, that movie made me a Will Kaufman fan. Mm -hmm. um, and once I saw that film, I was like, I got to see what other, what other stuff Will has done. And some of the best work he happens to do, you happen to be in those movies. Uh, yeah, Sanders and Saves being an example is that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, a lot of the films uh, that you've worked on with some of my favorite, new favorite directions in the last couple of years, you worked with Jesse before. A lot of my favorite movies that Jesse has done, you also happen to be in them as well, too. So, right. you know, it's like... Um, well, I, there's, one, there's one coming out. I don't know if you spoke to Jesse lately, but... I, this is anything? the, this is this, we spoke last year back in November. And I, at the time he did not say anything about the film other than that. It's a world war II project. And I happen to so see you know a, a little about it. I know enough about it. Um, but he hasn't indulged on me anything. So, um, I know that's still in the works right now. Uh, cause I know Jess right now, Jess is like knee deep in like three productions at this point. Um, yeah. that guy, if you want to talk about war workhorse too, that guy is another workhorse as well. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And yeah. and how he's going to give me the time out of his day because, like I said before, we're going to be interviewing later this af later this afternoon. Oh, today uh, you're talking to Jesse today. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. We'll ask him about. Oh, so that's Obviously. the name of the film. Oh shit! Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll bleep it. So. <laughs> I'll bleep it out. Don't worry. I'll bleep it out. I'm not sure. I don't think t saying the title is a problem, but it's. Um, I guess uh, once you talk to him, tell him. I mentioned the title if if I if he wants to snip snip it's yeah, up yeah. to him but all I all I'm gonna say for now is wow yeah I mean wow and this was a real indie uh, he just decided to do it real fast to fill the month of time again I was blessed to get the phone call but from what I've seen wow yeah wow. so Jesse we, we t I talked to him last year um, and he was you know we were talking about what uh, you know what it's, it's some of the thumb projects working on. And one of the things he was telling me is I'm working on a World War II project, but um, it's not going to be the typical films I've done before, like, you know, with, with Debt Collectors, Avengers, and so on. It's going to be completely different. Um, and then he said, but there are going to be some familiar faces. I didn't say anything at all at that time, but the first name that came to my mind, I was like, I guarantee Lewis is going to be in the movie. <laughs> I guarantee well, I was, it he's going to be in the movie. I, I always tell Jesse, when the phone rings and it says Jesse Johnson, I'm always like, wow, man, yeah. right on. It's always a great phone call. And Will, Will and Jesse have been great to me. And uh, on that note, these guys should be doing studio films, man. Yeah, I agree too. Um, but, you know, it's, but I, I think in time, I'm hoping people will pick up on that because. I think it'll happen. It's happening. Yeah. It has to, they're too good. I think, well, you know, Jesse is, because uh, we talked about it last year too, where um, Jesse and I were, were talking about his career and we were going over some of the things he's done 
And it wasn't until Savage Dog what really kind of like propelled his career where he started just working nonstop, uh, most of which were with Scott Atkins. And of course, you were uh, in there as well. Um, but ever since those movies uh, that he's been doing, um, he's been getting a lot more attention. As a result, now he's been doing, you know, he did that World War II movie that you that you just mentioned about here. And he also did White Elephant. Uh, I, I, I'm sure I, I can reveal that title because he posted on social media. Uh, working with Bruce Willis, o, uh, Olga, I forget her last name, but... Um, uh, and of course, Michael Rooker. And there's another project as well, too, that I believe he's working on, which has not mentioned at all. So I'm assuming that's a secret project as well. Um, I don't know how he does it. I give him a lot of credit because uh, when I messaged him a while ago, I said, hey, are we willing to do another interview with me? He's like, yeah, I just I'm knee deep in three productions right now and I'm trying to find a place to live. OK, great. Uh, let me know when you're ready. And then he confirmed for me and here we are <laughs> later today. So how, do, how is he going to do it? I have no idea. But I give you guys a lot of credit because, like I said before, I, I talked about how busy you are. Um, and how you manage all this, uh, all the things that you do. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I'm waking up here, like it's right now it's five in the morning where I'm at and I'm thinking this has got to be rough, but you know, in where are you at, you bro? Can, I'm in uh, North Carolina out here in the East coast. Okay. Yeah. So that's where I'm at right now. Um, thanks for getting up so early, man. I did. I didn't know that. Thanks that's okay. For, we could have yeah. done it. A little later, they could get well, some sleep, man. But I, hey. No, it's okay. I actually slept early last night in preparation for this interview here, so I I prepared okay. for that. Um, but that's but that's why I wanted to reach out. To, I, want, I want to confirm the timing for you because I didn't want to. Uh, mm. Hey, I can do it at five o'clock my time. I don't want to be like four in the morning for you. I didn't want to do that, so I didn't mind uh, making those adjustments. Uh, but again, so you know, I, I wanted to go over with you on some other things too that you had um, done as well in the past, which is that. Um, you know, I talked about a little bit with your background with uh, with martial arts, with sports, because uh, you are you were pretty much athletic your entire life at this uh, since you were a kid. Uh, and in fact, with your interview with Scott Atkins that you had done on the Art of Action, uh, that's really where I started to understand more of like how you took it seriously with your martial arts, with boxing, and um, you know, it was mainly focused on that. We I know you guys didn't really get much into any athletics side of it for uh, in, in terms of sports. Um, but I was curious about, you know, your, your, your career in, in soccer uh, out in Australia, because, uh, I did watch a clip that you did a documentary for, for the history of the team that you, uh, that you had played for, uh, which I actually came across it on your YouTube channel. And you talk about how, you know, what were some of the major highlights in your career, which were quite a, quite a few you had mentioned, but one particular one was about a game. I can't remember the details of the game off the top of my head right now, but you guys were relegated and you're trying to win to get to Brisbane to get back into the top uh, tier uh, league or something of that sort. Um, and then, you know, I know that you, your brother had played professionally too, I believe out in Greece, if yep. I'm not mistaken. So both yep. you and your brother and to some, in some capacity have a lot of similarities in terms of your career. Um, so between the two of you, were you guys doing that at the same time or was your brother ahead of you in terms of like playing soccer uh, professionally over in Greece? Because that's where he was playing, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, was that happening at the same time uh, when you guys were doing that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My brother's my brother's four years. He's got four years on me. And um, ultimately, you know, I turned pro at uh, 15 and a half. Oh, started really? Getting paid. Yeah, started getting paid to play soccer for a team called Melbourne Hungary. Costas was already in the first team. So I joined him and from then on, we played together uh, whenever we were on the same team, which was, I think, just Melbourne, Hungary. Yeah, that was it. Okay. Uh, then he, he branched off and went to other National League teams, I think Green Gully, et cetera. And then I ended up bouncing around and ending up at Heidelberg United. Uh, so, yeah, we played the same time. Then he had a stint in Greece with Panathinaikos. And, yeah. uh, you know, that was big time for him. He trained with Moch the coach at the time with uh, all the big stars. And mm -hmm. at some point, I think he made a decision to come back home to Australia. But uh, yeah, we both played soccer at the same time. Okay. He was, um, he was my bodyguard, by the way. He was my bodyguard. Oh, so and, did, uh, was your brother- Not kidding. Was, so, so, okay. So, so there was your brother an influencer on you playing uh, professional soccer at the time or was um, that on your own? Well, I mean, we all started playing, you know, five, six years old, we started playing. And then as we grew up, we continued playing. So um, I, I wouldn't say it was an influence. I just, we were playing soccer, Greek boys in Melbourne. You know, we didn't, we didn't not many of us were playing Aussie rules football. We all loved the soccer, the European love, you know. But yeah, uh, yeah we, we kind of, it, it was great. When we played for the same team, I, I, I love telling the stories how if anyone touched me hard, too hard, a little bit unfair, Within three seconds, they would be out cold. My brother was a, a bear. 
a bull. And he just used to steamroll anyone that touched me. I'll, I'll never forget it. It was great. So when I had the ball, I was a ball player. I knew I could do all my stuff. And if someone came to give it to me, three seconds later, the steam train would just rock them over. And he had a reputation. He was a hard guy. He still is. He's a hard man. Yeah. Well, so uh, let, me, <clears throat> let me ask you about your brother here, that, with you and your brother working together. Because I know you mentioned before in the past that um, – you know, any projects you have coming up, uh, you reach out to him. Hey, I think you'd be good for this. Could you help out with that? And so on. Or sometimes, hey, I can't do this project, but I think you'd be great for it. Um, talk to these people. So uh, I know that, you know, you and your brother have a pretty good relationship when it comes, you know, in your personal life, but it's also in, in your career as well, too, which is a, one of the things I want to uh, ask you about, because, um, you, know, uh, you know, I understand that in the industry that that could be a shaky thing uh, in terms of like how you know, where people's careers tend to go. And then there may be some sort of friction along the way. I'm not saying that's that case with you guys, but um, how, uh, you know, I would imagine with, you know, you, you, you and your brother growing up together, having that strong bond, still carrying that to this day. Um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, how has your, how have you and your brother been able to maintain that? Because, you know, you guys travel a lot and a lot of times you're not near each other. And the times you guys are in my, at least the impression that I get, you guys are, working together in some capacity. Um, but do you guys also have time to just hang out and be with each other and just not do anything with film related and just, just be bros um, at that moment in time and just reflect on whatever else you guys may want to get into? Yeah. Uh, especially with brothers, you're right. There's a lot of sibling rivalry. I've got a lot of friends that don't talk. You know, it just happens. So I don't know yeah. what it is. But um, my brother and I have seen some tough times, man. We grew up yeah. in a different planet. If you really want to know the truth, we we experience things a lot of people would want to experience in a lifetime, and 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 um, I think that bonded us. Uh, the family uh, bonded us. The 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 we're 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 lovers of ethics and honor. Uh, the old world Godfatherish type thing, you know. It's just mm -hmm. like that ethical street mentality, and that's kept us, I think, really close. There's never been ego with our career at all. And to be honest with you, I'm seeing him in New York at the end of July. We, we have a meeting set up there and uh, we're going to catch up. We really don't talk anything business when we're together. We just, we have, like you said, we bond, we have a good time. We talk, we talk about life. I mean, it's not like we don't mention any movies or anything, but you know, we don't sit yeah. there talking friggin' acting and, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's very simple to us. If I'm unavailable, I'll call him and say, hey, you want to do this? They're into you and vice versa. And when I'm directing, if there's a role, right? Uh, Blackout, he did amazing yeah. on that note. He came and helped us out on that and we aged him. He looks like 70 years old. And, yeah. and well, while I'm talking about it, we, we had this great pre-production meeting and I said, listen, I said, uh, I want to make you really old. We're going to gray your hair and whatever. And I'm going to put a bullet in your hip. I said to him, he says, why? He says, I said, we're going to, you were a war veteran. You got a couple of bullets in the hip. So create a limp, mother flower. He's like, oh, all right. Yeah, that sounds good. So we aged him up, created a limp, and we have a dear friend, a Virgo friend that we used to celebrate our birthday, birthdays with, uh, a gentleman who got voted one of the best bad guys in film of all time. His name was Bill McKinney. Oh, I know who he is. Uh, Deliverance, you yeah. got a birdie mouth, that mm -hmm. guy. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So um, I said, let's do an homage to our dear friend who, who passed recently, Mr. Bill yeah. McKinney. So yeah. uh, was, was uh, dedicated to Bill McKinney for what it's worth. But nonetheless, we, we, okay. we love to work together and uh, we, we have a really good time. Uh, a quick story, another thing, we did a movie with David Anspar, the wonderful David Anspar, Rudy Hoosier's director of those movies. Oh yeah, 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 I know who he is, right? okay, of course. With Jerry Butler called uh, uh, The Game of Their Lives or The Miracle Match, whatever the fuck they ended up calling it. And um, talk about sabotaging that movie, they killed that movie uh, in post. But uh, I'm not sure if you've seen it. Have you seen that one? I don't think miracle I've seen Match. that one. Worth seeing, even though they destroyed it, it's worth seeing. And when and if anyone or yourself see this, here's a little story, you're gonna love it. So David Anspar, oh God, there's so many stories to this. All right, <laughs> we have a little time and you can snip it. So they had a casting session for all the actors and you had to play soccer. You had to be at a high level of soccer or else, you know, how are we gonna make a soccer movie? So they had playoffs. They had like 785 people in the valley at some park. So uh, all the productions there with David Anspar, the director, and Angelo uh, uh, Pizzo is his name. I can't forget the the writer and blah blah blah. Everyone's there, and then there's Eric Ronaldo, the captain of America, who was in charge of 
the whole soccer stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So I have the flu. It's a Sunday morning. I am number four. I'll never forget it. 472 out of the 700 people, they give you a little tag. Mm -hmm. I went and had a nap. And I said to one of the guys, wake me up when they call my number. Oh, broken out in the sweats. I had a flu, whatever. Anyways, I'm a good ball player. I can hold my own playing soccer, let me tell you. So we ended up, called. they called me, I woke up. And then Eric, we got in a line that was 10 by 10 by 10. And he kicked the ball and we had to control it and shoot at the goal. And I said, all right, this is the first of many. I guess they're not going to just do this. So the ball came and went boom. I dribbled it and had a shot at the goal. Five minutes later, they're like, gather around, gather around. I actually love this story and I've never shared it. So okay. it's worth it's worth it. Um, so they say gather around and uh, all the productions back there. And Eric says, okay, these numbers stay. Everyone else go. He says like 480, uh, 422. Thank you. Everyone go. And everyone started dispersing. And think of a little boy in the schoolyard that doesn't want to go home. I just stood there and I didn't move. And I remember I had some friends waiting for me at the time and they're looking at me like, come on, let's go. And I stood there literally for four minutes and I'm thinking, no way. There's no way I'm not going to be in this movie. So I said, you know, this is when they call me switch. I said, fuck this man. Boom. I just switched. I walked right up to Video Village there and I said, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. So let me tell you all something. I said, first of all, I said, you're making a wrong decision because I'm the, you know, I said, talking myself up. I said, I'm the best ball player on this park. That's for sure. So you made me chest the ball and kick it. You think I can't play? I said, David, I said, I'm dear friends with one of your friends, you know, my brother Costas. I said, first of all, I'm, I did, man. I fucking did this. I can't believe I did it. David Anspar didn't know me from a bar of soap. All these producers are looking at like this crazy actor who's upset that he didn't get in the movie. And I'm all like, right. no, 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 no. Don't think that. I looked at David and I said, David, are you having a pickup game? And he says, yeah, we're having one next week. I said, Eric, David, I said, give me a chance in the pickup game so you can see what I can really do. There's no way I'm not being in this movie. And they all went like, whoa. And he says, yeah, I know your brother pretty well, actually. And he said, you might be here today. And uh, he says, all right. He says, arrange this young lad to come and play in the pickup game. <clears throat> it was next Wednesday. So this was like a Saturday. I healed. And then I trained every day. I ran, I juggled. In other words, I prepped for the game. I played the game and I just smashed them. I mean, I smashed them like this and with the ball. I mean, I was, I was possessed. You know, I was in fight mode, man. And Eric Ronaldo comes up and hugs me. He says, sorry, bro. He says, how could I have missed you? That's how I got the audition. Because then after you played the soccer, you have to go do a screen test. Mm -hmm. So that's a little story there for how I got that job as an actor, you know, how you can't give up. You've got to fight. You've got to, uh, right. in life, you've got to just keep fighting until it is dead and buried. Because until it's dead and buried, it ain't dead and buried, man. Cut to. Now, you've got two brothers in the movie. And with me and my brother, they had a four-week training camp for that movie. So for four weeks, we're playing soccer every day. And we went to St. Louis to start it. Back end was in Brazil. But we went to St. Louis. Now, four weeks later, we start shooting the first day. Now, everyone's in beautiful condition i'm skinny and slim my brother's skinny and slim we do the first day's shooting and mind you they had me do a lot of the doubling for all the other players which ended up being bad because the third day i pulled the hamstring because i was constantly doing stuff that no one else could do with free kicks and crosses you know they would do the you know what i mean yeah, I know what so yeah. so this is a great story man um <clears throat> the first day of shooting we're doing some ball we're playing some team and David's like pissed off. He's all upset behind. And because I'm an aspiring director, I'm always hanging around the monitor, you know, learning, learning. So I said to David, like, I can see him, he's doing this. And it was a shot of me. So I'm like, buddy, what's up? Are you, am I doing something? You know, like, he says, guys look exactly the same. He says, you're not brothers in the film. He says, I'm, I'm in trouble. He says, you look almost identical. You look like brothers, bro. What are we going to do? And I'm thinking, oh, far out. What do we do? What do we do? Well, not many people know this, but I was a really good hairdresser. I had my own salon. I worked for my mom. I was a professional hairdresser at the time. Oh, really? So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's another thing. You really are a jack of all trades. Yeah, I was a champion. I won competition. <laughs> renaissance man is what people are calling me now um, so i said to david i have an idea 
because Charlie Gloves in the book, in the photos, he had curly hair. So I said, we perm Costas's hair. Oh <laughs> and he says, what? Can you do that? I said, of course we can. He says, well, who's going to tell him? And I said, you are. He says, no, nah, Lewis. I said, he says, you go tell your brother we got to go perm his hair. And uh, my brother's a bear. You know, he's a bear. So I brought it up to him because everyone noticed the problem. He's going on. There's good news and bad news, you know. <laughs> and I said, bad news. Even. He was like, what? I'm like, buddy, look at the book, Charlie Gloves. Here and me, my brother now in the middle of the set having this debate. And he's like, I'm not perming my... I said, buddy, look at the book. He's got a permed hair. Perm your hair. And we look too much alike, I said. So ultimately, my brother went and got a perm. And guess who did the perm? You did. Yours truly, because the lady on set said his hair won't take. And my mother was the best hairdresser in my goddamn country at the time, for real. <laughs> Louise Mandalaris Theosopolis. And she taught me how to perm. And she said, forget the box. All the hair is different. You do the twirl. When you see the figure S, it's taken. Some hair takes 20 minutes. Some hair takes five minutes. But on the box, it says no more than 14. So this generic hairdresser and I get into a fight. And I said, be quiet while I'm doing this perm. I've got all the producers waiting there. She's saying he's going to burn his hair. He's going to burn his hair. I said, no, I'm not. Boom. I said, it's ready. Take it off. We rinsed it. My brother had a I won. We didn't look the same. I did the perm. And there's a story. <laughs> and my brother wasn't happy is the point he was miserable because right. fucking perm shit play. i never thought i would ever hear a story of lewis mandler getting in an argument with a hairdresser on set <laughs> because you were <laughs> better with perming <laughs> your brother's hair than anybody else that's a true that's, freaking story man that's amazing and i got another yeah. one too i did my go on, go first, on. first movie with um steve Stephen bauer uh, uh Stephen bauer and i were really good friends back in the old days and we did some movie i don't even remember what it was it was a marine movie First day on set, we've got like 10 Marines. We've got two leading ladies. There's no hair, no hair. And the directors and producers are like, what's going on? Oh, they're an hour away and they had a this and that and that. And I said to Stephen, because Stephen knew it was a hairdresser. I said, can I just start? He says, yeah, just fucking start, man. So I get the things out and I start going, bzz, bzz. I start cutting everyone's hair. Start, you know, blow drying the lead. The producers come in and he's their lead actor doing the hair. He's, what are you doing? But I had them almost done. An hour later, the hair gets there and they took over. But that's another one. That was a funny one where I got to do everyone's hair. I did a couple of flat tops. So, you, of... so you've been pretty much able to use virtually every aspect of your of your expertise on set in some capacity. It's basically what I I'm picking so. up on. Hairdressing, obviously, <laughs> artistry, uh, directing. I mean, I never mm -hmm. thought I would. That's actually the, one of the most interesting stories I've ever come across uh, as for, for any actor. <laughs> so... See, so th this is why this is why I found your your story to be amazing because, uh, like I said before, I I've, I've come across a, a lot of things you've done, but this is one of the newer ones here. So, um, so so let, let's let's go back real quick about the movie that you're talking about. Um, and, and forgive me because I actually was trying to write it down, but I didn't want to cut you off here. But th what was the name of that film again? You said you and your brother were working on that. Uh, was it the with, with the perm? Yeah, with David Anspa. It's got different titles. Gerard Butler is the star. It's called. The Miracle Match, or yeah. The Game of Their Lives, or Golden Goal. It's it's one of the three. But if you look, Gerard Butler, it'll come up. Yeah, I I think your brother was mentioning about him him working with him. And talk past. about a champion, by the way. Uh, Jerry Butler is an absolute champion of a human being, a real captain, and I uh, love that guy dearly. He's pretty close with my brother. I lost contact with him, but that guy's a gem. I found that fascinating here. But so let, let me ask something about your 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 background with regards to your Greek heritage. That's something that's I know that's very um, uh, that's something that's very important to you as well. Uh, but. It, and I hope you don't mind me asking here, but, um, you know, there have been a few times you were actually able to use the language um, on film and even on television as well, too. Um, are you fluent in Greek is, uh, yes. growing up? Okay, so you and your brother, because I know your brother speaks well, it. Uh, That's something that I, I also found very fascinating about your stories, because uh, you had mentioned before in previous interviews that growing up in, in Melbourne, that you had a pretty rough upbringing, because one of the things that stuck out for you was the fact that uh, you were Greek and you were also not treated very well um, as a result of your heritage. Um, and you were also uh, thrown insults as well too along the way. Uh, but it wasn't until later on where you started to become more appreciative of your, of your, of your heritage growing up, especially after you, I, I think if I heard correctly, let me know if I'm wrong, when you, with the success of my Big Fat Greek Wedding being a very uh, strongly uh, Greek heritage movie, um, you know, that almost in a lot of ways kind of helped uh, re, 
reignite your 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 passion for your culture. Um, so you know nowadays with with uh, with you know with uh, with the wings that you're going for you right now. Um, I'm curious now, you know, how, how involved you are with the culture in terms of Good question, Rob, I'm not sure how to answer it. Um, look, man, um, I'm a history buff more, more so now than in my life. And funny enough, I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to learn more about the history of my culture and the world. Actually, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the, the development of, of society, et cetera. Um, as far as my culture, man, I'm, 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 a a Greek born, sorry, an Australian born Greek. Um, I have the Greek blood. I have the essence of the mentality. Um, it will always be part of me, but I've been adrift for 30 plus years now, man. I, I haven't been to Australia for a long time. And yeah. um, I haven't been in too many Greek circles. Now and then I'll find them and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, you know, associate with them and it's fantastic, mm -hmm. but it's a big world out there now, man. And I'm just, uh, I have one love right now. It's my work and um, I bleed out my eyes for it. So I think it will always be with me um, as far as, you know, maintaining and, and, and uh, I guess connecting to it, it's always there. Uh, but uh, I live for my work and uh the greek in me will always be there i don't know if that's a, an answer but i don't yeah. cultivate it i don't yeah. really think about it too much to be okay. honest but i'll tell you what when i drive from bulgaria and i cross over that border my hair stand up and i feel like a different person when i'm in greece on greek soil yeah um, i've always been like that though uh since i was a kid i mean i love cameras i'm in, I'm in the film business and i love making movies but i'm not a photo guy <clears throat> you know when i travel i very rarely take photos and you know do what most people do i'll sit there for hours and and picture them building this thing and you know replay the hit of that person you know um i'm not sure where i was going with that idea i did point but at, at the moment it's, it's, it's slipped my mind but ultimately you know that's who i am i uh, i'm a passionate artist and that's my life right, right now but the culture will always be with me yeah, yeah, I, I and I'm only, I was only bringing that up here because, uh, like I said before, I've you know when I've come across um, you know w interviews with uh, with yourself, even with your brother too, to some extent. Um, uh, the the more interesting thing for me is learning about the person's background and you know how how they how in tune they are with it, um, because you know like for myself, for example, like I uh, you know I'm Hispanic. My family are Nicaraguans, I'm born and raised in Nicaragua, and they've been they grew up here, and that they came here, had me and my brothers. So anyway, so um, like one of the things that I always found fascinating for me with anybody who has a, you know, have a very similar upbringing in terms of like being born in another country, but their families are, you know, back from home. Uh, I took for granted with a lot of the, uh, you know, the culture that I, you know, have grown up with. And in some ways, I've kind of distanced myself from it. But then in time, I've learned to appreciate the culture and, and be, you know, better acquainted with the language. Uh, I might mean, still speak and write and, and read the language. But you know, it wasn't until as I got older that I started to learn appreciate that more often uh, being around my family. And, you know, I, there's really not that many Nicaraguans around here other than my mom, you know, my uncles uh, that are they're here, uh, my siblings. But, you know, outside of that, um, it's one of those things where once I'm involved in that environment, uh, it's like a whole different uh, ball game for me. I, I, I you mentioned before your hair star rises. I feel the same way, too. I haven't gone back to yeah. Nicaragua in over in quite some time. It's actually 20 years this yeah. August. Real quick, you've, you've, you've made me think of something. I'm not sure why I'm going to share this, but maybe I'll find a point. Okay. What, what made Fat Wedding amazing was what I learned was that all cultures feel the same way. Right. They're proud. All cultures have a crazy family and a crazy aunt. It's mm. actually true. Mm. And I'll tell you a great story. Uh, I was doing martial law or just finished martial law at the time when I did the first Fat. It was around that time and I was getting a lot of uh, recognition for martial law. So I love Chinese food. I'm downtown in LA and I'm in this Chinese food restaurant by myself. Uh, could have been dim sum because I love my dim sum. But I remember there was a big table of an Asian family and they kept looking and pointing and waving. And I'm like, all right, they recognize me from martial law, you know. And after I finished my breakfast, I walked up and said, hey, guys, how are you? And they said, hey, we love your work, whatever. And I said, yeah, Samo and the show, it's fantastic. And they said, uh, what show? I said, martial law. They said, no, 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 fat wedding. We love fat wedding. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm like, oh my God, this is an Asian family who are saying, telling me stories about they've got the exact same family. Yeah. And 
I realized, wow. So now the question becomes really relative what you asked. I think like yourself, we all have the essence of, of the inherent feeling of our culture and our, our, our origins. And it's so important. And it reminds me of another story. Fat Wedding was such a universal success that it was pretty unfortunate that there was another movie that came out the exact same time that was called Monsoon's Wedding. I don't know if you've seen it. I've heard of that, but I don't think I've seen you it. you got to see it, man. It yeah. was beautiful film. It was one of the beautiful films I've ever seen. So here's a story for everyone. So after the Fat Wedding Rush, I mean, I couldn't get into the theaters. I went to go see my own film in LA. I couldn't get in the first two times. It was just literally full. So after like the second or third time, I said to my pals, I said, you know what? There's this thing called Monsoon's Wedding. It's playing in the next theater, literally. I said, let's go check that out, man. You know, it sounds like a good film. I've heard good things. We went in there. There was five people in there. So everyone's going to see this Fat Wedding thing. And so they should. But here we are now no one in the theater there was a couple of people three rows in front of us yeah so we watched the whole movie and i was in t i mean it was it was amazing was it a comedy or no on. sorry was that a comedy it was no it was a as a legitimate film just like fat wedding okay it was it, I mean, fat wedding was more or less more of a comedy yeah right, right. this was just it was just a story about a family an indian family and it was called monsoon's wedding a oh, wedding okay. film now the lights go on and the gentleman in front of me is with two people, an elder, elderly man. He gets up, he turns around. It's Michael Constantine, the father in Fat Wedding. So I look at him and I say, are you effing kidding me, bro? And he says, Louis, my God, what the hell? I said, we're sitting here the whole movie. He says, it was full. I couldn't get in. I swear that happened. So we both really enjoyed Monsoon's Wedding. But that was a really funny moment where the father of Fat Wedding is sitting in front of me. We're watching this movie because we both couldn't get into our own movie it was a really cool moment in time but um yeah i just thought i'd mention the fact that even the monsoon's wedding was so beautiful and you appreciate the culture of the world it's fascinating yeah and, and that's what i'm saying because like uh you know films like that that come out um once in a while have that impact but but a lot of, when i saw my big fat greek wedding at the time i remember it, it reminded <laughs> me a lot of my own culture too um yep and you mentioned before it's 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 you can you can look at that story and it can be an italian hispanic polish family it could be Absolutely. anybody and it's all virtually the same the only difference is obviously the language and the actual culture in itself but the the essence of the characters we see that in everybody um so in that regard i i did connect with the story well here's what i wanted to ask you about uh because we talked before about jesse and jesse actually because i'm looking at my notes right now jesse actually brought up a really interesting story about you that um, I actually think is rather funny and I'm hoping you can kind of elaborate here. So one of the things that he had pointed out about you was that during rehearsals, um, he, you know, he, he talked so highly of you, but he said that at one point uh, you were, I guess in, in rehearsals, you don't necessarily go all out. You just kind of, you know, just read the lines and don't, you know, he said, you don't let it out of the, out of the box, if you will. And a lot of the actors that were rehearsing with you were like, is he going to be like that? Just kind of reading the lines kind of blandly uh, because, he, you know, I'm trying to trying to get a feel for the scene in the rehearsals, but he's not giving 100 percent. And, you know, Louis, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Jesse went up to you and pulled you to say, hey, you know, are you OK with doing the scene? Because the actors are wondering if you're if you can give a little more something. He's like, no, 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 I'll, I'll I don't want to let it out of the box right now. When I'm on the set, I'll let it, everything out. Uh, and then later on, he picked up on that. You know, once he worked with you, obviously, that's you know, that's the case. So. Um, you know, when I hear that story as well, uh, this is kind of the a polar opposite, <clears throat> excuse me, the polar opposite of what I've seen and heard about you, where, you know, you're always 100%. You give it 100%. But the rehearsal is one of the very few times that I've heard where the actual, the actual where you're a little more reserved, a little bit held back. So I was hoping if you can kind of clarify that with what Jesse had informed me here. Wow, interesting. I didn't know other actors felt like that about that. Um, yeah, he's right. I, I see it like this. Why am I going to spill my beans during rehearsal? Okay. Because, because the honesty doesn't come all the time. The honesty comes maybe one, you get one real take, man, out of five or six that you're happy with. Of course, there's an edit and you can chop and, and match and mix. But what I like to think I do is save full performance for when it matters to keep it fresh and keep it honest. And... Um, what I think I do is for the other actors and myself, 
and it's funny, I do have a lot of directors coming up to me saying, can you give me a full rehearsal? And because I don't, I do, he's right. He's actually 100% right. I, I don't like bringing it until it's time to bring it. It's, it's like a boxing match. Why am I going to do something in the dressing room and punch myself out before I get in the ring, right? I mean, that's my metaphor. But my explanation as an artist and let's say a doctor of the arts is for the other actors, what they're misunderstanding, the ones who said that, they should think about the fact that I'm not desecrating the performance because I'm doing the dance. The timing's there, my delivery's there, I'm saying the lines. So I'm not ruining the articulate flow and the timing of the scene, far from it actually. What I'm doing is I'm saving some magic for the take, hence when we roll, we can surprise each other because acting is listening. Acting is being at the disposal of someone other than yourself. That's the key, man. It's not about my performance. It's about me listening to you and reacting in character. So I'll rehearse and do the, do the give the right timing and I'm there and I'm present. But if it's a scene where I'm you know, going to go somewhere serious emotionally or physically, of course you've got to say it. You know, I mean, to me, there's no other way. So, for example, if I'm looking at someone right now who's threatened to kill my child and I'm going to look at him and say, you know, let's say it's written where I'm screaming bloody murder, I'll say the lines with the intention, for example, if you ever do that again, you're going to find yourself waking up, head butting an ice pick. Do you understand me, mother flower? And then when they roll action, I can turn it on and say something like, if you ever fucking same energy, uh, sorry, same timing, but then here I am with giving the performance. So I guess there's two ways of looking at it, man. I don't know. I don't, I just, uh, if another actor requested, I'll do it. I'll, I'm there for the other actors, but um, I have a belief saving it for, for filming. Okay. Yeah. Cause like I said before, I, when, um, when Jesse shared that, and then I'm doing some research on you, uh, like I said before, I pick up on the the intensity you bring with your with your work. Um, so I was actually quite surprised to to hear that story because you know it, it seemed like you would be bringing that all the time in the rehearsal uh, part of it here too. Because there's even a, there's even at one point I remember um, I, I actually kind of picked up on it after the fact where there was actually a behind the scenes where you and Scott were doing a rehearsal uh, on in the trailer. Yeah. Right. Or debt collectors, and there you just seem really relaxed. You know, you read the one where we didn't even say the words. We're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Up, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you say the lines too many times, they die, man. What yeah. am I going to do? Do a performance yeah. in the trailer? We're just running lines, getting the dance, getting the rhythm, and that's why I love Scott. He works the same as me. We'll rehearse it. We'll drill it. We'll get that dance tight. How about <laughs> this? That's the thing. Me and him, we right. we spent a lot of time rehearsing, man. Yeah, yeah. And when we rehearsed. You know, we'd, we'd be in each other's, you know, we'd rehearse, but you got to save it for the ring, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny because uh, Jesse also shared a story about Scott well, with uh, Benjamin where he told me that he was in the hotel sleeping and then someone was uh, was kicking and screaming or something of that sort down the hall. And he was about to confront the person, hey, can you keep it down? And it comes to find out, it come to find out it was actually Scott just rehearsing his line, but just going full blast in preparation sure. for for the, the the upcoming shoot uh, for that day um but again i guess it, it just it really just depends on the the timing the day whatever else here's that. the thing though here's the thing on that note too when, when i rehearse i will i mean there's a time where you'll you'll give it to see if it feels right mm -hmm. but then once you do it once you know some directors are like let's rehearse it again let's go again let's go for sound let's do marks are you kidding me? What I'm going to go, I'm going to do it. You know what I'm saying now? Mm -hmm. So there's a time where you test it, yeah. but then you got to, you got to sit on it, man. You got to keep it here for performance time. So that's just, that's just how I think I roll. Yeah. It works oh, okay. for me. Well, I'm glad you cleared it up because like I said before, um, you know, for, for me, you know, having never been in the industry at all and, 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 but knowing enough about how, how things work, the, the, this is one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about too, because um, it's, everyone has their method of doing things, but I think the most important thing is learn when to let it out of the bag, if you will, and when to keep it in place. So that way you don't um, overexert yourself in, in time for the shoot. Uh, and I think a lot of people may take that for granted because, you know, some, uh, sometimes I'll, I'll watch a film with an actor and I know they're more than capable of doing the job, but for whatever reason, that particular film, 
didn't come out as well because you know you come to find out behind the scenes that you know whatever they were going through the time you know they it may have affected them so there's a lot of different variables that come into play with that that's why i wanted to talk to you uh, with regards about your career because you managed to keep a consistency with your performances um which is that you you've always put in 100 percent uh in every film that i've come across with you and you know, I know there are some things that people may not notice that you've done as well, which I hope this will bring some light and bring awareness. Uh, Cause there's a lot of great projects you've done as well too, that I've come to love. And I think are very fantastic movies. I mentioned before about, about I'm sorry, I meant to say uh, the brave, um, a few other ones as well. They had mentioned daylight's end, the curse <laughs> blackout. Um, and I, the, the sensei, which is a really good film. I think it's a very underrated movie in my opinion too. Um, <clears throat> it definitely deals with a heavy subject matter, but it's a very good one, I think, that uh, I think was very important to tell. But at the same time, when you come to learn about what the person goes through in making that film and what, they have, what they've gone through to get to that point, it's very important to remember that, you know, it's, it takes, it, it, there's a lot that's evolved to get that to happen, to make that happen. And it's not always easy to keep that consistency going. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you, because I, I always believe that you're one of the very few actors in the industry right now that's been able to maintain that for such a long period of time. Um, Thank you, bro. Yeah, and I think that you are, in my opinion, one of the best working actors in the industry right now. Oh, uh, bless you, you, man. Of, I appreciate it much. Uh, I appreciate it. That's the, that's the truth right there. And I also believe that you are one of the hardest working actors in the business as well. Um, and I'm hoping that more people will come to know your know your work. And I hope with this interview that will be that they will shed some light because I'll definitely have some images for them to see so that we're aware of what I'm right talking on, about along the way. And on, on that note, you brought up something that if I can share, it's really sure. interesting for the brave. Okay, people don't realize this too. It's like I got a call on a Friday in LA, and William said, "I want you for this movie," and I said, "Fine." He says, "Where?" Bulgaria. I said, "When?" He said, "Tomorrow." I haven't even read the script. I don't know anything. I'm unprepared. I'm un haven't been training. Actors, the, the the bigger actors sometimes prep for a month or two or six even. Character physically. Here's an action movie with a guy with the strangest accent in the world, and I'll talk about that. So I get on the plane. I'm reading the script on the plane. I land. The next morning, I go right to set, and I've got six pages of dialogue. I'm the lead. I've got six to ten pages of the first day's work. I mean, that is incredibly. I mean, an incredible amount of pressure. I'm helming this film and I read the script an hour ago and now I've got 10 pages of dialogue. And then when I get there, Joe and William pull me up and say, what accent are you going to use? I said, what do you want? And they said, let's do in New York. I said, simple. We did the first rehearsal. I did it in New York. This is a true story. William, to talk to Will, bring it up with you. And they came up to me and they said, oh God, it's not sounding right. And Will said, let's do an Albanian accent who's lived in America. On the spot for the whole movie and the world's got to believe it. And I said, okay. So I said, give me a second. I went into the corner. I started blah, 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 and I came back. We did the second take, an Albanian accent, which was pretty good, by the way, okay. with, who's lived in America. Then they come back and they say, no, nah, that's not working either. Now I've also got the pressure of everything else going on. I've still got to go to wardrobe and get my hair and I've got to do the 10 pages and they're setting up the lights. We don't even know what accent I'm going to use. And then he says to me, you know what, man? He's doing New York, but he's from Albania. So he's from Albania, but he spent, he lives in New York. So just give him a, a hint of an accent. And that's what we ended up going with. So if you ever see the movie or a scene again, if you really listen, I mean, I think I nailed it. I, it's I, New I, York, but there's a hint of like European in there. And that's yeah. what we ended up going with. So you ask yourself, well, you know, I mean, it's hard, man. It's pressure. And then I'm opposite Armando Sande, one of the best mm. actors ever. And yeah. he's just ripping it up. I mean, it was hard to act opposite him because you just want to watch him. He's just so real and present and powerful. And then here I am watching him thinking, oh, my God, is this guy's going to blow me away. And now I'm going to do some fake fucking Albanian accent. You know, I mean, there's pressure. There's a mind game. There's insecurities. It's horrible, man. But that's when you just got to love what you do and trust yourself, you know. But yeah. these are the pressures that people don't realize. Then they rent the film and they judge it. But they don't know. Yeah. Right. All of that. Yeah. And, and that's why if for someone like myself, like I, like I said before, I'll, I'll watch them. I, I watch plenty of films and, you know, a lot of times, you know, I've, I've in the past, I've been very judgmental with a lot of movies, but then again, as I learn more about how, it, what it takes to make a movie, my perceptions change on, on looking at the performances and the act and, and the, the directing or whatever else. 
Um, but you know, again, but there are some films right off the bat that give you that first impression. It's amazing. Like, Brave was one of those films in the last couple of years that I saw that it blew me away. I was very, very impressed with the movie. And then when I learned after the fact what it took to make the movie, um, it was a low budget film. I was like, you couldn't even tell by looking at it. No, yeah, it's so well done. And and like I said before, Will Kaufman, in my opinion, is one of those directors that is under the radar. That if people happen to look under all that rubble, you'll find some precious gems in there. And I think he's got a plenty of films that can back that up. The Brave being one of them. Um, but you know, again, I I I I point these out because I, I'm very passionate about that. And I know some people don't care. I know people sometimes will just, you know, look the other way. And, well, you know, if, if the film is good, that's good enough for me. Yeah, but, you know, there's a lot more to it than just that. And I think that's very important to highlight. And I try to highlight that with everyone that I talk to on the show to point out the the difficulties of what it makes to take a movie, but also understand the, the, the variables that come in that you have everything planned out to a point, And then for whatever reason, it doesn't work out. Um, so it's like, it's, <laughs> yes. it can be very, it's a very difficult process. And it is. Uh, some of the actors that I've come across, I'll, I'll mention Scott again. Um, you know, this is a guy, you know, in, in the interview you did with him uh, for The Art of Action, he mentioned before that he has a love-hate relationship with action movies that he's worked on because it's so hard to make. Uh, in fact, you guys highlighted a lot with what you guys had done on Deck Collectors 2, which he mentioned before where he had to be on a drip because he was uh, exhausted. He was uh, 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 losing uh, fluid. And, you know, doing that fight scene you guys have in the alley, um, which, you know, you don't notice it when you watch it. But when you learn about that, you're like, holy shit, that was an amazing scene. This is what he had to go through to get that. Um, but it's like, you know, those little stories help me appreciate the film a lot more, um, you know, and the people that are involved to make that happen. To me, it shows how dedicated Scott is, how dedicated you were as well, too. And Scott gave you props as well by saying, you know, it was easy to work with you because you were on point. You know what to do. And I didn't have to worry about you messing up. And if we did, you know, it's something that's out of the out of your hands, but you were able to manage it afterwards. You made me think of something. It's true. You, you know, what the actors said about me, about the rehearsal and everything, it's like a fight scene. You'll work out the dance. You might do it full on once or time in the gym, you know, once or twice in the gym. Let's go one full one to see how it feels. But then afterwards, when we were rehearsing, it was like just touch. It was the timing. You know, we weren't putting any energy. It's like duk, 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 dunk, boom, 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 boom. So I'm just bringing that other point up again. It's like right. rehearsing for the scene. So in a sense, that's a good ex metaphor to explain how I work with the, the, the creative process with not giving 100% before rolling, but still doing the exact movements, the exact timing. Makes sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, like I said before, I, there's there's a lot that I've taken a, a, a lot from learning about people who who put in the work in, in the films that they make, because sometimes, like I said before, people take it for granted. And I know most people won't care. I do. And I think it's important for me to highlight because here's the thing, this is what I, this is one of the reasons why I do the show. Um, because I want people to, hold on, what's it, my dog's right here. Watch out, kiddo. Watch out, watch out, watch out. He's kind of underneath the desk. Hold on. <laughs> Beautiful. Hold on the cord. I didn't want you to, uh, I didn't want to lose uh, communications here. Hold on. Watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out. Over here, over here. Good boy, good boy. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, so, yeah, I, it, for me, it's very important to highlight those things because uh, I, I, I like to look back. I, I would like for people to one day possibly look back at this. And, you know, for me, I always get the best education from the people who are in the industry. How I've learned a lot about you is simply from your interviews. How I've learned a lot about you as well as from talking to Scott and also listening to Will Kaufman and Scott Atkins and everyone else has worked with you in some capacity. Ashlyn Yenny as well too is a good was someone that gave me some insight about you. Uh, some things she you had shared with her while on set for Antidote, and those stories don't make it out. And you'll never see that in like the EPKs of the DVDs, the Blu-rays. It's always just you know the 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 prettier set of things you know well it's great and, and it's and i know that's true but little nuggets like this are really where i think you get the most education from because that's where you're going to learn the the real deal of what it takes to make a film what it takes to go through the process and you know if if anyone were to go to film school i'm not saying not to do that but if you're going to go to film school i think you can get a lot of what it takes in terms of making a movie by listening to these stories and hearing what it what's involved with that and the sacrifices you have to make and the the hard work you have to put in the hours and the uh decisions you're gonna have to make where you're probably gonna be looked at as the bad guy but you're not the bad guy you're the guy who's trying to get the job done 
but everyone else in some capacity is not keeping up with you because they don't understand the, 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 the value of time and how important it is for you to stay on point and be on schedule, be prepared. And I think that's extremely, extremely important. Um, I'm not going to lie and say that, you know, it's also um, that I don't watch a film. And I think, oh, that movie was terrible. I'm not saying I, I still don't do that. But, but even if I have to learn after the fact, my opinion of the film may not change, but I appreciate what it took to get to making the film. Um, so I try to be very cognizant of that. But when I talk to individuals who are in the industry and they share that with me, or I listen to their stories, that's fascinating. And I hope in time when people wonder, what was it like for making an independent movie in this era? I think this is where you're going to find it. This is where you're going to learn that information. You're going to have to do some digging. That's just the nature of the game. You just have to put in the work. And if you, and if you put in the work, you'll find the answers. Um, yeah. And I found a lot of things about you just by doing my research that, you know, a lot of what you happen to share, a lot of which I didn't want to bring up because you've talked about it on more than one occasions. I don't want to uh, bore you with that stuff again, but, but there are other things too that I think people don't realize that you've done that I think happens to be very, uh, very important to talk about. Uh, given your background and the films you've done, who you've worked with. Uh, and that's all very integral. People will look at, look past that. But in my opinion, that's the most important thing in a person's career uh, and how they were able to formulate the decisions they've made to get to where they're at now, what they've learned, what they haven't learned. So, I mean, I'm rambling on about this stuff here, but, you know, I, I hope you can see that that's, you know, that's why I wanted to do this because this stuff is very, very uh, important to me. I'm very passionate about that. And I hope that by sharing these stories, people will pick up on that if they just do their research. You know, if, if, if people were ever look, un, understand the, the, the value of, of hard work and teamwork, uh, working on a production, listen to the people that have been in it and listen to them when they're, you know, stripped down from all that and just l listen to them bare bones <clears throat> and you'll get the story. And I think that's what I um, am hoping to accomplish when I do this show, when I talk to people in the industry. Yes, I want to talk to them and get to know them, but, you know, let's, you know, I want to get them to share sure. their insight about what they've gone through to get to that point and the varying successes they've had and, you know, some of the hard times they've gone through because that varies between uh, actor sure. to actor and director to director and so on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's I think you're right. I think you're right, Rob. And, and, and it's reminiscent of symposiums Etc. Where you know you 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 listen to these amazing artists who have been around discuss things that you don't usually get to hear on you know twenty minute or fifteen minute interviews or you know like you said behind the scenes DVDs they show so much but having a conversation or listening to a conversation with you know people who are, who are professionals and successful in their field absolutely it's 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 extremely valuable and to to absorb and retain all the information, assess it and make your own decisions to push forward. I think that's, uh, I think you're right. I think it's invaluable. And these conversations are great. I love listening to interviews more than anything because you get to know a little bit about the person and the storytelling is what we do. A great book is story, 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 Robert, uh, uh, I forget his name. God, I can't believe I forget his name. I was gonna say Robert Greene, but he did the 48 Laws of Power my other favorite book, but story, story, story is a great book. And one of the opening passages is what do we do every day of our lives? Whether it's the family at the breakfast table, people at restaurants, walking down the street, everyone's telling a story about something. Am I wrong? Every yeah. day, every conversation, everyone's having in the street. It's a story. Hey, what happened today? What's going to happen? It's a story. Life's a story. It's a yeah. storytelling process. And we reflect that. And that's why I love our business, but there is a process and it's extremely difficult. And the main thing is you're dealing with people and their emotions. That's what I've realized, especially when I'm at, at the helm of a project. You're dealing with time. Everything that can go wrong will go wrong. Like you said, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans, et cetera, et cetera. But then the icing on the cake is dealing with people, crew, their emotions, what's going on in their private lives. You know, he's late, he's on time. They're arguing, they're having an affair. And, oh my God, I just want to make a movie. So that's what happens when you helm a movie. There's so many things playing at the same time. And it's one of the most difficult things you could possibly do. And at the end of the day, all you want to do is, you know, recreate life and tell the story. But to do that and create that corridor visually and emotionally between action and cut, it's, it's horrifyingly difficult. And yeah. to be honest with you, when I start a film, I say the only thing that matters to me, guys, is between the words action and cut 
all the other stuff you guys take at home, I'm not interested. And for all of you, focus on those moments between action and cut. Don't let anything get in the way of that corridor because that's where the movie lives. That's what people see. That's what people judge. Like I just told you about Brave. It's the first time I've shared that, but no one cares. They want to enjoy the movie. They mm. don't care if I just got the script an hour ago. Do you know what I mean? But it's yeah. great to hear the stories and it's yeah. great to learn. Wow. I didn't know that's how it went down. And that's what makes these conversations fantastic. Yeah, I, I think, you know, because you, you, you brought up, uh, going back with the Brave again, because you brought up uh, how people, I brought up before that people don't care as well. But, you know, I think the mindset is that, you know, that's their job. Uh, yeah, I, I get that. I understand that that's the job. I understand that's what they're signing up for. But I think it's, you know, it's like any other job. You, you, you take on a project, you do something, whether you like it or not, or whether you're prepared for it or not, you know, you have a responsibility, which is, you know, expected, but, you know, I, I wish people would give actors and, the, and directors, producers, everyone the time of the day to hear their story, because you mentioned before about some of the projects you've worked on where you talked about posters, the posters don't do the film justice, you know, they say it's like a hodgepodge of just mixing you know, let's just put this here and then it'll look great for the, you know, for the, for the. Imbeciles. Uh, I'll say it again. I'm going to grab so, you guys around the neck and choke you out. Or work on a movie you guys. that Post is. The guys. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you work, Rob. That's okay. It's okay. So you work on a movie that, that it, you know is great, but then it's edited a certain way where it doesn't do the film justice. And, and then people get that first impression. And, you know, I've, I've seen enough films so I can kind of pick up certain things here and there. And when you learn about their history, Oh, okay, so now it makes sense why this one was like this. So I'm, you, I, you know, I know enough about that at that point. But it's, it's, you know, it's one of those things where nowadays, you know, w let's use um, like uh, Zach Snyder's example as a director. One of the very few people in the industry that has the opportunity to go back on a film that he worked on that never got to complete or got to complete but never actually got to fine tune and 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 finalize the, the real vision that he wanted, and to have that opportunity, I don't think it's ever happened before. So. I think in some way or shape or form, that's slightly going to change. I don't know if it will actually have that impact for everyone else in the industry, but you know, it's, it's a rare opportunity for someone who has worked on a project to go back and say, this is how I really wanted to do it. And I'm going to show it to you the way that I want you to see it. And it's not, it's not a very common thing to, to do. Um, and someone in that position, you know, can say that, well, you know, someone who looks at it from the ass may say, well, he's a Hollywood director. Yeah. But even they still have to go through the struggles too. Uh, maybe not to the same capacity as an independent director, but they still have to go through the same you know hurdles that everyone else has to go through. Um, but I'm hoping that as time, as time goes by that the opportunities for indie directors and directors in general, uh, they will be given the chance to really showcase what they want to show, whether they limit the budget's a limitation for them, but they still have the opportunity to show their vision, to show, to really express their, their voices, if you will. And everyone else involved would help, uh, you know, do that as well too. Um, that's why I always look forward to your project because I know that with what you're going to do, you're going to give it a hundred percent. And I'm, 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 I imagine that everyone else that notices that will say, all right, well, this guy's bringing up his A game. So do we. You know, Jesse's mentioned that before on more than one occasion. Scott has mentioned that before. Uh, even Ashlyn uh, mentioned that as well, too. So, you know, there's there's something about you that I picked up on when I watched Debt Collectors that really, uh, where I really gravitated to your performance, but then I also gravitated to your film work, knowing what you've, uh, what, you know, your, your, uh, your work ethic that you bring to the projects. And, you know, I've been a fan since Debt Collectors, but I became a big fan and a, uh, a supporter of you uh, ever since I started watching all the other works outside of Debt Collectors, where I really started picking up on your your career and what you've done, who you've worked with, and you know any project you have coming up here, uh, I always look forward to it. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to see every single one because uh, there's quite a few you've done that even I have a hard time keeping up with. Um, but it's something that I I am now a, a staunch I am very a, a staunch supporter of you. Um, ever since you know I saw your movie uh, Debt Collectors and. I'm very grateful that you've given me the time and I'm, I'm unfortunately I'm gonna have to cut this off real short because I do have to get going, but I, okay. I want to, I just want to make sure that I give you the opportunity for you to close out here. But I, but I wanted to say to you that, you know, uh, considering how long it took to get to this point to, for us to actually get this to happen. Um, I appreciate it. You taking the time out of your day to speak with me and give me the time to, uh, for me to ask you the questions that I want to ask for you to elaborate on, on stories that um, that I've come across about your career, your life, and also sharing some insight that I was unaware of that you were also able to share. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's an exclusive, if you will, that you're sharing me the stories for the first time. 
Um, and, and I also hope that people who watch this interview will look at your films and take the opportunity to uh, reach out to you and say, hey, I saw this movie that you did, loved it. Can't wait to see what else you're going to be doing next. That's really what I want to aim for and help and promote you as an actor, as a director, producer, writer, all that sort of all that sort of stuff I meant to say. So, um, you know, that's my close out to you. I don't know if you want to close out anything uh, before you head out. Um, sure, man. Um, uh, oh, uh, real quick, I'll touch on studio directors. Opposed, you're right. Independent films, you have a lot more creative control. These studio guys, man, you have no idea what they deal with. You know, a lot of edits they deliver, hence why there's director's cuts. There's so many cooks in, 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 in that arena when you raise the budgets and deal with the studio. So it's pretty difficult. Um, the vision is very rarely the director's vision, in my, my opinion. Um, on another note, we could talk for, for hours. It's been a pleasure, Rob. I know you have to go. So I just want to finish by saying, I want to thank you, man. You're an eloquent, smart, passionate man. You love film and you've been really kind to me. And that's why I'm doing this because I don't do too many of these. Um, not that I don't like it. I'm just kind of not into exposing too much of myself, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but you've been great and I've had a really good time, man. And I appreciate uh, all the kind words and I appreciate your, your intellect and your love and your passion for what we do, what we bleed out our eyes to do. And thanks for the acknowledgement and having me on the show, bro. It means a lot. Thank you. Oh, I, I, the honor was mine really. And I, I, I hope that, uh, like I said before, um, you know, if I, 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 I'm kind of nervous to say this here, but you know, if you're ever in the area one day um, here in North Carolina, um, please reach out to me. I would love to take you out for a, a bite of a meal here and continue on the conversation from there. Um, but otherwise, like I said before, I know you're a very busy man um, and I'm very grateful you give me the time um, for me to be able to do this here with you. Um, I look forward to your upcoming projects. I can't wait to see uh, your film Smokers. I don't know if you have uh, any insight as far as when that could be expected to be released. <laughs> You know, I'll finish. Let's finish this interview with that then. Um, <laughs> it, we've talking. We've talked. We've covered a lot of ground here as far as making films. If you haven't seen the heart of dark, the hearts of darkness, the makings of the apocalypse, now yeah. do so. Yeah. Anyone who hasn't seen it, it's one of the best documentaries ever made. Well, Smokers has been my hearts of darkness, man. Um, the absolute most difficult process in my life. Again, you want to make God laugh to limit your plans. We've had. We've had a death, we've had lost footage, we've had people getting hurt, uh, me included, hospital, uh, drives being corrupt. I mean, the list goes on. It's taken me over a year and a half to get it to this point, and it's really taken a lot out of me. And again, once it's done and people see it, uh, and it doesn't bother me at all, it's just life. They will judge it. Hopefully they like it, but they'll be like, oh, yeah, whatever, what's up with it? Two years of bleeding out my eyes with, with, with things that you can't imagine that have happened, but the movie looks fantastic. It's a heartfelt, uh, uh, it's a heartfelt film, even though it's an action-based film. And this summer it will be done. And that's why I'm in Romania actually tying up some loose ends with smokers. Um, it's been a process and um, making an independent film is truly one of the most difficult things a person can do. If it's truly independent, meaning one person makes the film, not an independent studio, or you get $2 million and you call it an independent film. I'm talking about Louis Mandelor waking up with a script, making phone calls, crewing up and doing everything. You know, I mean, that's an independent film and it is extremely difficult, but it's looking good. I want to thank everyone that's stuck by me. And uh, come this summer, you're going to see an ultra violent, heartfelt, passionate story. And I can't wait to release it to the world because it means a lot to me. Yeah, I can't wait to see it. I'm looking very forward to seeing that as well, because uh, I know I've, I think I heard about this project for yeah, you mentioned over over a year ago. So yeah. I was curious to see when that would actually come out for everyone to see. It's so, been a tough one, man. Yeah. It's been a real tough one. Yeah, why? Well, I, I again, I appreciate your time, and um, you know, I can't uh, say nothing but great things about you. And you know, my experience here with you now uh, certainly has solidified that for me, um, and I'm very grateful for that. And, you know, you've got a supporter here, man. You, you've got a, a strong Louis, Louis Mandelor supporter uh, here in the States. And uh, Thanks, Rob. I, can, I can say nothing but high praises for you. And I can't wait for any upcoming projects you have coming along the way. Um, but uh, if, 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 did you want to close out with uh, any sort of uh, uh, a way for people to follow you on social media that you may want people to uh, be aware oh, of? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, you probably know more than me, man, because <laughs> I've got a lady who helps me. God bless Holly. 
love you, Holly. You've been the best PR lady I, I could ever imagine. Um, well, I got a new Instagram account, official Lewis Mandalore. They canceled my other one, these Instagram peeps for no apparent reason. Uh, I've got my two Facebooks. I've got the blue mark on the on one of them. Okay. Follow me there. And I've got the website. What's the website? Lewis Mandalore? Yeah, Lewis Mandalore.net. Yeah, there it is. Thank you, yeah. Rob. My website's lewismandalore.net. So yeah, that's it, man. And um, I think all my information's public actually now, phone numbers yeah. and everything. So um, that's it, man. It, it was a real pleasure and God bless you. Keep up the great work, Rob. And uh, I'm tuning into your stuff too now, man. I love watching it. I'm going to, uh, I've got to take care of some business. Then I'm going to watch the uh, Ashton Jenny interview after this tonight. Yeah. Well, it, so I appreciate you doing that here, but uh, just so you know that um, that interview that she has, uh, we, where we talked to you about, uh, we talked about you. She, like I said before, she shared some insight that I was uh, not aware of, and I'm sure when you watch, you'll you'll be a little surprised to see what she shared. Nothing bad, nothing bad at all. Okay, but, but just more like. So I'll, uh, I'll wait to see it. You won't share now. I'll wait to see it. Right? I would I would rather you watch it and, and okay. see what she has to say. And, and it's all great stuff. No, nothing negative at all by any means. But hey, it's it was negative. I got to take it on. I got to well, take it on the chin as well. Yeah, it's negative. Well, she uh, she mentioned some things about how you were very upfront and very open about what you've been through, and she shared a slight insight on that. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. I didn't want to bring it up here because uh, I just uh, wanted to focus more on your on your career. Uh, as far as what you've been through in your life but when you hear that part of the interview I, i'm sure you'll, you'll you'll know what it is that you talked to her about interesting uh, very yeah. interesting so on, uh, on that note about alice ashland she is so good yes and she's such a pro and yes. she carried that movie and to carry a movie you need to be able to carry a movie and she's gonna go places she's great the camera loves her she was a real professional did she tell you that I actually got hit in the film? Did she tell no, you that story? No, no, she didn't tell me that at all. All right, let's finish with this. I've done a <laughs> bunch of action films all my life, from martial law to Van Damme to friggin' Scott Atkins and the break, blah, blah, blah. Right. Never been touched. Never been touched. I've hurt myself in different ways, hurt myself. So antidote at the end, remember the guy, there's one punch thrown in the movie where the doctor yeah, yeah, yeah. punches him. Mm -hmm. I had reconstructed surgery on my eye after that. Are you I, serious? Uh, yeah, he broke a bone in my eye here. My cheekbone got a slight fracture. He's a big, strong dude. And he caught me with a left hook and I was just standing there, you know, doing this feeble uh, doctor, playing this feeble doctor. And right, he right. cracked me. I got hit so hard, man. And I didn't drop. I turned around, took a few steps. And because I've been hit before, I said to the director and everyone, I said, let's go right now and get my close up because in about a minute, this is going to go poof. So we quickly did, a, I think, a series of my close up. And then I went home and I think I wrapped. That was my last night, funny enough. I wrapped. Uh, and I think a month later, I had to get, get it fixed. I uh, never complained, never went to SAG, never insurance and all that bullshit. That's how we roll. <laughs> And on that note, we're going to close it out here because I want people to know that that's how you do films. You stay on top of it and you push right through. So I thank you very much, Lewis. I appreciate you, your time again. It was a real pleasure, man. I had fun. Likewise. Man. I likewise. I'm glad you did, man. And I look forward to upcoming projects. But until next time, you stay safe out there. And uh...